that's going to be Draymond's go-to now. Then if they make the playoffs again, just throw a heat pack at the referee. You know, I'll take the 100K, mate. The way Murray was shooting, he shot three for 18 that night. So I'm not surprised that he missed the referee on that <laughs> on that throw in the fucking. Welcome to Rogue Bo's Basketball Series. Uh, another few weeks of basketball playoffs. We're in the second round. We've got a lot to get through. We're going to recap the first round victories for the most part and then kind of give our analysis currently on what's going on in the second round. The Boston-Cleveland game is ongoing at time of recording. Looks like Boston should get that one, but you never know with them. Uh, they are up, I think, 13 with about nine minutes left. OKC and the Mavs will be on during this recording, so we can't really get too in-depth in that series. It's currently 2-1, but we'll do our best. And then there's a, a lot of news, a lottery pro, a lot going on in the NBA world. I think it's the best time of the year uh, for NBA basketball pro. Um, just it, it's more basketball focused. We don't hear as much until LeBron gets a little antsy that n not much media attention is being put on him and he drops, drops some stuff. Um, which I think he'll drop. I'm calling it now, Pro, by the way. Sorry for the long-winded intro, but I'm calling it now. I think the – because LeBron hasn't technically confirmed he's coming back for next season, whether he's going to retire. He's going to drop that somewhere in the NBA Finals is my prediction, Pro. I don't know if that's paying $1 and one cent, um, but I think he's going to drop some newsworthy stuff there. But uh, what's going on on your, your end of the world, Pro? Uh, not much, Bogues. I, I – uh... I definitely think you're right on on target with the with the NBA stuff. Less less drama. There is some a little bit of it, but more basketball. The series are pretty good. Everybody's in depth, especially after the first round. You know, I think everybody's now sort of locked in everything, and you know the series get a little tighter. It, it's uh, it, it's pretty good basketball for the most part. Um, the, probably the toughest thing you got to do is some series like if Doris Burks on the game, you got to mute it. But you know, you know, you got to <laughs> shut off the volume. But besides that, um, it, it's it's pretty. It's been pretty pretty good, pretty productive in the playoffs. Just so not everyone thinks pro sexist, we, we, we also mute. Oh, I at least mute Van Gundy as well. Stan, uh, he's, Stan, he, he's brutal. Yeah, uh, Mark yeah. Jones is brutal. There's a few brutals floating around. I, um, but. I think she's good. I think, I, and I'm not gonna go. So too rehearsed. Far it's so pre-rehearsed. Yeah, like she wants to. She wants to win an award on every take instead of being like it's just letting it come. Yeah, throw a few of them in there, but like it's just too. It's sort of like seriously. It's like she's accepting the fucking Golden Globes on every speech, uh, every every statement, and it's just like, come on, let's. Let's stop the fucking madness. I do like Jamal Crawford and Reggie Miller, though. Jamal Crawford's pretty good. Uh, I, I I actually get a little bit of a kick out of them uh, doing games. But, um, yeah, no, it's it's cool. It's a good time of year. And you, you can find some gems on the NBA TV telecast generally because that's where they have, like, one – got people that you rarely hear on national TV. So you, you get some rare ones every now and then. But, yeah, I've, I've got I've got a couple of friends that say the same thing. When, when Doric Burke, Doris Burke is on, they – they have to mute, and it's not a it's not a female male thing. It's just mm -mm. she's clearly got cue cards that she's prepped before telecasts, and just goes to them with the puns, and it's it's just very forced. Um, I really, you know, Mark Jackson, Van Gundy were probably the best banterish. Um, oh, I think by far. Co combo in in game live commentary that we've had, akin to kind of the NBA on TNT, but they don't do in games with Chuck and and, and Ernie and the, all that. But um, yeah, the two best, I think. In my opinion, Hubie Brown by far right now, and the second, which I I, I only started listening to him maybe like a, for just for a game, is Tim Legler. I think Tim Legler is low key like I think he could do really well with this because he's really he's really good with his takes. He's very informed. He's um, I don't know about the humor part. But like he's very good, and he's he's not condescending about what he knows, and he just sort of gives it to you straight. I think he's I think he's a star in the making. I think he could be a really good um, analyst for sure. You know, yeah, he's he's done a pretty good job too on the Talking Head shows and ESPN. But let's get into it. Let's go go through New York and uh, and Philly. We'll wrap that up. I had them. Mm -hmm. I had Philly winning this. You had New York. So congratulations, pro. You want one and one and zero already, <laughs> uh, but. It was uh, it was an interesting series. I, I thought it was looking at the stats. It was actually much much closer. So the ser even though it was four two, the series averages get this one hundred and eight point three points for New York, one hundred and eight point two for uh, for Philly. When you add up 
kind of altogether the series averages, which is pretty pretty insane. It came down to point one, but obviously, I think Philly had a big win in game three by eleven. The rest of the games were, were all under ten. Um, but but pretty swingy series for the most part in games. There was a lot of different runs. Maxi would go on runs, but Embiid was okay. Uh, slow and out of shape, in my opinion, for most of the series. It looked that way. He came back from 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 injury and all that. The Bell's pause, he didn't help. I think a clear case of numbers lie in this series for Embiid. 33, and 11, 33, 11, and 6 a night on face value. You look at that and you say, that's not too bad. But 44% from 2, 33% from 3, 4.2 turnovers. The thing that killed me with, with Embiid Pro was – he just looked like he didn't want to be out there when they were doubling him through different phases of this series. Um, he seemed to be very frustrated and would just give up. What I mean by that is you'd throw the ball down to him. that He'd see the double coming. He wouldn't even try to make a play. He would just stand straight-legged and just rifle that ball out to someone else. I think when you're when you're that guy, you gotta, you got to try to make quick moves, get to the basket, try to do something quickly, and then make the defense react. He was just staring down the double, just looked like he wasn't there, didn't have his legs under him. Brunson, huge for New York. I mean, 35.5 a night to go with nine assists. Um, I'm going to go with my voice. The pivotal guy for this series, I think, was Josh Hart. Um, you know, Brunson's scoring obviously puts him up for, probably for MVP of that series, but I'd argue Josh Hart was just as influential. 17, 12, and 5, but he's – some of the key rebounds he grabbed late in games, some of the key deflections he made, uh, hit some big threes late in those games in the series. Um, just unbelievable as far as just an intangibles guy. He plays like a like a four or five man uh, on that wing position with just how physical he is and how he attacks the O-board. Um, and just finally, Tobias Harris has been blamed for Philly's demise. Look, is that fair, Pro? I want you to answer that after you go through this series. I don't think it's that fair because he's a clear third, fourth option. He had a horrible series. Don't get me wrong. He he, he wasn't great. His shooting splits were awful. Um, he was probably a guy that they probably needed more from to try and just sustain some momentum in that series. He was nine points a game with seven rebounds, but 43% from the field, 33 from three. But wasn't really getting touches, really. I mean, he, you go into Embiid, um, and then Maxi is your second fiddle. He was getting mass shots up. Then you got factor in Ubre, who was their third best player. A little harsh on Tobias. Definitely needed more. He still got your seven boards a night, which means he was putting in effort to get some rebounds from the wing spot and the four spot. But um, just a tough one. He, I think he's in that offense. He's kind of that fourth spot. Some nights he's going to shoot ten or fifteen shots. Some nights he's going to shoot two. He's kind of that role, similar to Harrison Barnes, kind of with the Warriors. Um, it's just some nights you're going to have it, some nights you're not. And I think his confidence went downhill in that series. But to blame him, I, 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 I think I loved Edward's comment. I don't know if you saw those uh, in, in this series when they lost Game Three. He said it was his fault. I think this is Embiid. You know, he's got to be better. Thirty three, eleven, and six at forty three, forty four percent. Uh, with 4.2 turnovers is unacceptable. I think he's a much better player than that. He was last season's MVP. For them to go through, he, they needed more from him just on a – even just a – we spoke about him trying to pick up full court in a key possession against Brunson, just shit like that. He was just constantly doing some crazy stuff, not to mention the dirty stuff. But how did you see this series, bro? Bogues, I saw it – I see it uh, like you did a little bit, you know, with Josh Hart being a huge part of it. He He sort of reminds me of Jimmy Butler. You know, just a intangible, tough, grinds you out defensively, comes up with the big loose balls, comes up with the rebounds, you know, takes it to the basket, aggressive, not a great shooter, but, you know, does the best. I mean, at times he could knock it down, but I think he was sort of the the guy to go to here. Now, OG and Anabi, you know, throughout the year, his problem is staying healthy. You know, he's had a problem with that throughout his career. And obviously we're seeing that in the next round. I guess we'll we'll cover that. But, you know, he was huge in the series. But I think Hart really was a big part of things. Brunson, I, I heard a stat by Ryan Russillo today listening to Bill Simmons and Russillo talk. He actually had a great stat, folks. Now, um, Brunson's averaging 27 shots a game. He averaged 29 shots a game for the first round series. Going back 40 years, folks, there's only been a, a few people that had more shot attempts throughout playoffs than Brunson. First was 31 shot, uh, 32 shots a game. Uh, Michael Jordan lost in the first round. This is, this is what they averaged 
that year and what they did. Jordan, 32, lost the first round of the Celtics, got swept. McGrady at 31, back in like 01, lost in the first round. Then you had Russell Westbrook in like 17 or 16 when he won the MVP, lost in the first round. Allen Iverson, 29 shots. Um, they went to a final, which the whole team was geared around him. And then you got Luka at 28 and Brunson at 27. Luka lost in the first round at 28 shots a game. So I think what it's telling you, and look, stats sometimes lie, but I think what it's telling you is like you got to spread the wealth. It's really hard when one guy dominates. In some instances, like Brunson, he needs to because he's really the only uh, big time elite scorer in, in, in that group. Josh Hart, Ananabi, uh, Di Vincenzo, those guys are good players, but they're 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 guys that play out of space. And just sort of either straight line drive, catch and shoot, you know, they do their thing. But Brunson's the only guy that could truly create. So I understand the the inflation with that. As far as Philly is concerned, I think they're way too top heavy. You know, when you're having, you know, when you're having like Embiid, Maxi, Embiid, Maxi, Embiid, Maxi, and then you just sort of kick out to the rest of the guys, you kick out to Oubre or Harris. You know, it's really hard in the NBA, in my opinion, and, and it shouldn't be, but it is hard to sort of be that guy that just sort of stands there, watches two other players play, and then if they get in trouble and they just kick out to you, late shot clock, time bomb, you have you to better be able make to this. Produce. Yeah, you better make this shot. You haven't touched the ball in 15 possessions. It's tough, <laughs> but motherfucker, you're making $9 million yeah, yeah. a year on average. You better do something. You know, And look, it's not Tobias Harris's fault. Should he have stepped up more? Yeah, he's a pro and he's getting paid 30 plus million bucks a year. You expect a little bit more production. He knows what he's sort of signed up for. You know, he didn't sign up. You know, obviously he got there and all that and signed his contract. But like, you got to beat him, Maxi. You got to be able to deal out of that. But for Philly to really take that next step, I think, Bogues, you know, in the playoffs in the next coming years, look, I'm not a huge Embiid guy. He's a big time talent, but I don't think you could truly win with him. That's just my opinion. You know, either it's a health thing or it's just sort of a style of play thing. Look, you know, you ask him to be dominant, he's dominant. The problem is the way he's dominant, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really transfer into winning. I think they really need to be able to take less shots. I think less shots, you know, is good. Like taking high teams, it's not going to be perfect every night. But like, you know, they did also did another stat like, you know, there's like 25, 20, 25 plus straight games with with Joker, who he didn't take 20. He took 26 shots the other night. There hasn't been like 20 straight games where he hasn't done that. And you know how productive they are as a team. I think you got to be able to really spread it around and really make yourself tough at a guard. I think when it's just going to be the Embiid and Maxi show, and look, Maxi's really taken a step in his development over the last 12 months, no doubt about it. But I think like, you know, when you're expecting Ubre, you got to spread it around to be that much tougher to, you know, to guard. You know, Buddy Heal, guys like that, they can get well, that's shots. The thing, I was going to mention that, pro Buddy Heal. Yeah. You know, twelve minutes a night. I thought he was okay. Like he was, yeah. he shot the ball from forty six percent from three. He was their best three point shooter in the series. They yeah. can only find twelve minutes for him with 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 Tobias shooting at thirty three, Kyle yeah. Lowry shooting at thirty three. Yes, Kyle See, Lowry brings you defense, but. With, with doubling uh, Embiid the way they did early and hard, Buddy Heald should be in your twenties in that series. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of like a guy like Tobias running him off like dribble handoff, let him drive to the basket because he is really good at like score getting to the rim, scoring that mid range, force that second defender to come up and then make a play. You got guys that could you know spot up and shoot. You got Max who could shoot. You got Ubre who could make shots. You got. You know, Buddy Heal, like we talked about, but you got to do more action than just throw it in Embiid and everybody get out of the way, run and pick and roll with Maxi and Embiid. I think you have to really get those guys on the move, get Ubre on the move, get Tobias Harris on the move, letting them get straight line drive to the basket. I don't like to say downhill because it's a fucked up cliche. It's a fucked up term because the, the court's flat and you're not going down anywhere. But when you go like dribble handoff, get them, you know, slash into the basket. I think you got to like find ways, ATOs, whatever, you know, to get those guys touches, get them moving. Because those guys are very good, in my opinion, on the move. I think when they're just spotted up and you're expecting those guys to make shots, it's really tough. But when you get Ubre moving, you get Harris moving, you don't have to give them 38 shots a night, but I think you got to spread it out. 
Uh, for the Knicks, look, they're, they're next guy, next man up mentality. Yeah, they're high minute, but I think those guys play hard. They play together. They move the ball. You know, um, they've been fun to watch. They got a ton of injuries, and we'll talk about we cover the next round. But that's sort of where I saw the series. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. Um, yeah, I thought it should have been closer, but yeah, Philly just just and B's gonna get in shape and stay out of, stay out of injury trouble. And I think work on just not not having those hollow numbers in a playoff series. I think it starts and ends with him with that team. Maxi obviously has been fantastic and will continue to get better. Bucks paces four two. Uh, Credit to the Bucs for even getting this to six, in my opinion. I think they, you know, the injury bug for them. Lillard was out for stretches of games in this series. Middleton was banged up for most of it. Um, you know, they had to deal with a lot. Portis gets ejected from a game, you know, so they they, they had to deal with a lot and they, they grinded out six. So I, I thought that was impressive by them. Um, Siakam, 22 and eight a night. Middleton, 25 and nine. Uh, Lillard, was the uh, the leading scorer in this in four games? Um, as my phone goes off, uh, was the leading scorer here with, with with thirty-one, but only played four games. I thought I thought Brook was 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 really good on the block at stretches in this game in this series, and they just they just went to it for 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 a spurt, and they'd go away from it. I thought he was giving Miles Turner some problems um, with with all that kind of you know that that post up like foul trouble, and and, and Miles didn't really have. Uh, kind of an answer for it in stretches, but they just, I, I, I felt like once they became real depleted where it was clear Lillard was out, Middleton was kind of limping around. I was like, just go, just get some shooters around Brook. He can, he, he was decent on the, on the block. I was surprised they didn't go there, but um, Halliburton found a little bit of form in numerous games. He was at 16, nine and six. He's, his offense still isn't there. He's three point shot, 30% for the series. Obviously needs to be better in the next series and it has gotten better. Miles Turner with 19 and seven and shot it really well from three. He, he shot it 44%. Um, Lopez and the Bucks were in that drops a lot with Miles Turner. So he was averaging seven attempts in this series because of it and knocking them down. They didn't really adjust throughout the series. Obi Toppin was, was I think, very, very good just running the floor, 12 and six. But numerous times the Bucks would score, Indiana would inbound for a fast break dunk. It was amazing um, how many times they got that, especially Obi Toppin. So the Bucks just, you know, and you could see the fatigue playing that Indiana style of game. Um, but yeah, to go to go six games, I credit the Bucks, but uh, Indiana moving on in that one, bro. Yeah, look, Indiana looked great. You know, they just sort of stayed in it, and it, it, even when Milwaukee stole a game, you know, they stole a, you know game or two. It, it was they just sort of stayed the course, and they just start they just kept going at you. And I think that's one thing that that Indiana's done all year. Um, you know, Rick's always been, Carlisle's always been high paced. You know, those guys spread the floor. They, they, they stretch you out. Look, I, I thought Harold Burton was okay. I think he was banged up. I think he had a back or something like that. You know, he, he, he didn't look like, like himself, 29% from three. Um, he was decent at times. Only went to the line once a game, but I thought that, you know, I, I thought that Siakam played really well. I thought Toppin played really well. You know, Turner stepped up, and they just sort of they they never went away. And I think in the playoffs, if you can keep your head above water and you just keep on attacking your opponent, like you've been seeing in this playoffs, especially as we get you know deeper and deeper into them, guys get banged up at the most inopportune times. You can get hurt, and all you got to do is sort of just keep your head above water, put yourself in position to win. Those guys never went away from you know how they play. They share the ball. They shoot the three. And I I didn't even notice Bogues until I heard it on uh, Simmons's podcast. I forgot Matherin's out. I, I didn't even notice. Yeah, you know, that's how much of a scout I am. Yep. But I, I totally forgot about that. And Toppins played great. Nemhard, you know, just next man up. And I'll tell you who who the low key MVP of this whole playoffs is is TJ McConnell. You know, that guy just comes and just attacks you. He doesn't, he's not flashy, but he just like gets to the paint, paint pull-ups, get into the rim, finisher, tough, you know, and, and they just play hard. Look, for Milwaukee, it's all about injuries. You know, Lillard was hurt. You know, Lillard has his Achilles, you know, flare up deal. You know, Middleton was on one leg. The guy still, you know, the, the guy still put up points, put up 25 a game for the series. Um, you know, obviously Giannis is out and it just um, I, the the big thing was the you know the bi- the big thing was the Portis ejection because you know they still have a chance to win with him because he plays hard you know he's tough to guard he posts you up he faces you up and drives you he can make shots you know even though he didn't you know didn't shoot it for great from three from the series but 
I just think that, yeah, they were just overmatched. You know, like you said, Lopez in the post, you know, look, if you're posting up, I don't know if you're, it's different if you're, it's not like you're posting up, I don't know, like, you know, Giannis's brother or something. You're, you're posting up, you know, you're posting up Brooke Lopez, you know, Brooke Lopez, you know, for a time was one of the most dominating low post scorers early in his career in the NBA. He's got a very high basketball IQ. He's got great skill. He does that. And look, when the other team is going to switch one through five all the time, and you could just post him up on switching or duck in on the backside when, you know, when they have to pull over on the weak side and, you know, drive and you just dump down on duckins. I think you got to do that and, and not go away from it. Anyways, uh, I, I think it's a credit to, you know, Indiana, they played well, they stayed in it, they stayed tough, and they stood the test of time. I, I thought there was a, a, a part of me that thought that, you know, that, that Milwaukee was going to take that at the end. But, you know, look, they just they just kept the Jets on and they just put the pressure on and they kept it going. Yeah, man, it was, it was yeah, I thought it was going to be a, a, a wash once those injuries came and, and Lillard had hurt his Achilles or his calf. Um, I thought they'd be in some trouble, but credit to Indiana still go through those ebbs and flows where they – They'll, they'll look like a Hall of Fame team for a quarter and then look like a G League team the next quarter. That's just the way their offense is. They're going to dry up through stretches and then they're going to go through stretches where they just, you know, in six minutes they score 25 points. That's just the way they play. They played all season. In the playoffs, it's a smaller room for error, um, which has been interesting in the next round. But Orlando, Cleveland, good old-fashioned seven-gamer pro. Um, I didn't know this, though, but it was, it was uh, the biggest comeback in, for a game seven in NBA history, I didn't know that. Um, I just just read that now. Uh, the Cavs really? rallied from Cavs rallied from eighteen points down uh, to beat the Magic. So it's the biggest disparity or, or kind of lead change ever in game in game seven NBA history. Uh, a pretty good series, ugly series. I don't know if you saw any of these games. I, saw, I caught a couple Mm-mm. of them towards the end, and it was ugly. It was <laughs> ugly. It felt like it felt like early two thousands, late kind of that early two thousands era basketball. The Pistons and the Pacers and all that kind of stuff, where it was just grind out, ugly offense, uh, low shooting percentages for the most most part. It just wasn't wasn't pretty basketball. But you know the Cavs get it done. They they steal one. Um, you know Donovan Mitchell twenty eight a night in this series. Uh, Jarrett Allen seventeen and fourteen. He's he only played four games in that series. Got hurt. Still not playing today in the, in the current series they're in. Um, which is against uh, against Boston. I'm not sure even if he played today. I don't think he did. Mm-mm. No, it's still out. So, yeah, he's pretty much out. Um, Garland with 15 a night. But uh, Orlando Banquero, 27 and 8. He really lifted this playoffs, bro, and he should, you know, credit to him. You know, the three ball was always questionable with him. He shot it at 40, 40% from three. He rebounded the ball well. Turnovers a little high. It was 4.6 turnovers to four assists. But that's normal for a young player, I feel like. He's starting to see double teams and different things that he probably hasn't seen in the league yet. So he's adapting to that, and that's something they'll probably work on in the summer. He's studying that film and and picking his spots on on when to go and when not to, and not turning the ball over because he's going to be he's going to he, he's going to be the head of the snake for this team for the next five ten years, right? Um, so he's going to have to learn how to deal with those double teams. Wagner start off the series unbelievably. He was their best player the first couple of games and kind of fell off towards the end. His shoot percentage just clamped down to forty percent for his nineteen a night. Uh, 26 from three. So he was shooting it really well early and then just fell off a cliff. Um, Suggs gave them 14 a night, but uh, a pretty good back and forth series, a grind out, you know, it wasn't a price of admission type series, but, you know, Cleveland prog- progressed to the next round. But Orlando, you know, as much as they've gone through, um, they've got something to build on now. I think their bench needs some work. They definitely need to f- get a bit, you know, Isaac was okay. I mean, Ingles, uh, his minutes completely dried up in that playoff series, um, but they don't have a lot on that bench. Gary Harris, 26 a night, gave him four points. So I think they're going to look to shore up their bench. They're rumored to be looking at Clay Thompson and a few other guys for that squad to, to, to shore up that their lineup. But uh, it's 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 good to see them back in the mix. I think Orlando's obviously had their ups and downs to see them back in the mix in the East. I don't know if that's a testament to the East not being as strong as it once was or Orlando getting better, but it's probably a, a little bit of both, but uh, an ugly series for the most part, bro. Yeah, really ugly, no, without question. Um, you know, look, Donovan Mitchell, you know, that he just does what he does. He he scored. He, he just sort of was a, a consistent scoring threat for, you know, for them. Didn't shoot it great, but, you know, as far as from deep, but gave him the score and punch. They, you know, him, Garland, Mobley was up and down in this series. I think he's playing better in the second, you know, in the second round. 
you know, then he, he was just a little bit up and down. They're just not a, they can't really do a lot with you, you know, right now. Like they're, they, they've been very inconsistent over the last, you know, the last half of the season, but you know, look, they're tough. Um, yeah, like not a pretty team to watch, but I like J.B. Bickerstaff. He's tough. He always instills toughness with his teams. He does a really good job. I think on the Orlando side, you know, Boncaro and Wagner, I think to take the next their next level of development, they got to see a shooting coach in the, in the offseason. They got to up. Now, Boncaro played, you know, shot the ball really well in the series, but he's at around 34%. Wagner, I think, shooting the high 20s. I think to really – this team really needs shooting. You know that, that. Look, they've got young stars, or they got young good players. I wouldn't call them stars. Yup, on Cairo probably has a chance. Um, I, I think you know Jamal Mosley does an unbelievable job coaching the team. One of the better younger coaches in the league. Um, they need shooting. They've got. You know, I think they got to shore up what they're doing at point guard. Is it going to be Suggs? Is it going to be, you know, I think Suggs played really well defensively, shot, the, you know, improved his shooting. You know, he's finally healthy throughout the year. He was good. You know, um, I agree with you. Their bench was just okay. Cole Anthony was just all right. I really like Anthony Black, young kid. Um out of te- you know, out of Dallas, who went from Arkansas, had a up and down first year, but I think he he's like a Sean Livingston type. He's good, but they definitely need to up that bench up, you know. And, but they need to really improve their shooting. Um, like I said, it wasn't really a, a popular series for me to watch, but uh, it was you know, look to to go seven games is still a war, it's still a battle. Um, Cleveland, you know, they're slugging out with Boston in the second round. We'll talk about that in a minute, but yeah, not, not a very entertaining series. Definitely not, but, uh, Cleveland progress. We'll get to that shortly. And then <clears throat> final one in the East, I mean, Celtics versus the Heat, Celtics cruise to a 4-1, um, no, no Cinderella this series, Miami just too shorthanded, but that wasn't an excuse from last season, but this, this part, this season now, you know, j- just not enough, not, not enough to really push Boston. I mean, Boston still even in that series, even though they cruised for the most part, there, there were instances where they looked vulnerable. Um, it just seems like Boston kind of punches the clock a lot um, at times, but, you know, Miami getting game two and the rest was kind of history. Miami kind of, um, even though the score lines reflected, you know, 14-point win, 20-point win, there was still times there where Miami were, were in the game, but then, um, you know, it kind of rattled Boston to say, all right, we better handle our business. We're not going to do it again this season. And and they did. Bam out of bio, 22 and 9 with four assists. Tatum, 22 and 10 with five assists were the probably the best stat getters for that series. Um, Miami, yeah, just just the role players weren't enough. Um, Tyler Hero, 17 and 9 at 38% clips, not good enough. Um, uh, Caleb Martin was okay for him with 11, and Juarez Jr. was was okay with 13. Uh, DeLon Wright ended up cracking the rotation and played some decent minutes for him at, with eight and three. Uh, Derek White been shooting the hell out of it. We'll get into that later in the in the stats segment, but uh, 20 he was 22 a night in this series, um, shooting get this 58 50 just under 58 percent, just under 48 percent from three and 90 from the line. So had a hell of a series as far as shooting clips go. Porzingis. Injured in that series was was at twelve and five. Um, I don't think there's been anything come out about he's still dating kind of day to day. We still don't know exactly when, <clears throat> when he's going to be back, but it was at calf slash Achilles, wasn't it? Um, or yeah. Ankle, <clears throat> something yeah. along those lines. So yeah, I, I doubt he'll be back. But yeah, this this one went as most people picked. I, I gave I gave uh, Miami two wins in this series just because I thought that they would you know, Boston would not show up for two games out of the series, but they showed up for, for four out of the five and uh, got the easy win and got some rest to to, to get them to the next round. Probably. Yeah, I mean, look, this is a talent league, Bogues. It's always good, like, when teams are undermanned, you always – yeah, you you tend to root for the undermanned team, but when you're losing, you know, not only Jimmy Butler but Terry Rozier, I mean, those are two huge losses for those guys. And, to, you know, you're playing, you're playing arguably the best team in the league um and and you're shorthanded with those two guys out it's really it's going to be really tough and look this the you can't really fully evaluate it but when you're trying to evaluate Tyler Hero and you're trying to evaluate what he means to your organization and being able like everybody like everybody complains about not being the man always wants to be the guy it's always your team you know you want it to be your team well he had a chance you know it's funny like last year he was out they made that, that that big run in the playoffs. Now he has an elevated role because of the injuries, and he really didn't play well. You know, seventeen a game, but we we talked about the splits on his percentages. 
And look, that's what your chance and your opportunity. Yes, you're way undermanned. You don't expect to, you know, to carry this team when you're back, but he's not that type of player. But I just sort of see, you know, you sort of try to evaluate where, where guys are. Um, you know, Bam Adebayo showed up, played hard. You know, Walkers, we talked about it, played hard. You know, I, I really like to see Jovic. It was good to see him, you know, play big minutes throughout the stretch of the series. He was okay. You know, it, it was good to get minutes and get, you know, get some experience under his belt, but they really didn't, they, they didn't really have much for them. You know, Duncan Robinson, you know, played, played like 12 minutes a night. You know, Kevin Love, really uh, non factors. But, you know, for Boston, it's just, for me, Bogues, it, and we'll get into it later, I guess, but. Boston's just not really an enjoyable team for me to watch. They're really good. You you appreciate how good they are. But the ball stops. Like when the ball moves and guys are cutting, you know, hitting guys in the short roll, guys are cutting off of that from the corners and they're spotting guys or spotting for three. It looks great. But when that ball stops with Tatum and Brown, it, it, it's not pretty. And, you know, I really like watching White play. I really like watching Horford play. You know, love watching, you know, guys like that, Drew Holiday you know, it's just those guys, no offense to those guys, they're high-level players, Tatum and Brown. They're just not, to me, they're just not fun to watch. It's like ISO, 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 fadeaway jump shot. You know, it's just, they make the game at times way more complicated than it should be. And they're so hard to guard, you know, when you go through the possessions and the ball moves four, five, six times for a straight line drive or a lob or a, you know, driving kick for three, extra pass. That's when that team's unguard, totally unguardable, totally unbeatable. But when that ball sticks and they want to play hero ball, your turn, my turn, uh, it, it gets to be pretty ugly pretty quick. Yeah, I agree with that. It's it's still <clears> – <throat> that was their issue the last four or five years. It was the Tatum Brown, okay, here your possession. It's kind of like summer ball, right? you got two stars yeah. on your team. Go ISO, get your bucket. They kind of went away from it a little bit. Yep. But it, see, it seeps in for stretches. I totally agree with you. It seeps in for stretches, you know, and Tatum's a, a tough shot maker, but you hate to see three out of four possessions for wild step backs from three or just four shots. And then Brown feels like he needs to do the same. Um, when they're moving it and not thinking too much, it, it looks so pretty, but they, they definitely get bogged down. Look, you need those shot makers. We don't know that finals playoffs. You need a Tatum, you need a Brown, but sometimes they go to it a little bit too early and too soon. And it, it definitely, it's just ugly to watch with so much talent they have. I think they can definitely share it a little bit more, but that one went as expected. Uh, let's go to the West. OKC New Orleans, we, we touched on that last week, but OKC pretty untouched in a 4-0 four, four sweep and got some rest. CJ McCollum, 17-6 and six on bad clips, 37% and 22% from three. Ouch. Um, not much there. I mean, uh, New Orleans' offense just sputtered completely. They, they looked, you know, I think OKC's defense was good, but they – I don't think it was elite, um, and it just, I don't know, it was their scout or they just have their number. I thought New Orleans would at least make a series out of it, a la Bucks paces, get, get to maybe a six-gamer, the amount of length and size that uh, that New Orleans have, but they just they just couldn't get it going. Uh, Valentunas, next best with 14 and 11. Uh, Ingram had a pretty horrific series. He was 14 and 5, 34% and 25 from three. Just could never get in the rhythm. Um, a bit of infighting there with the head coach, apparently. So uh, he's, we'll touch on that later, but on the, on the trade block. Uh, but just, yeah, series that was pretty box tick for, for OKC. Uh, SGA, 27, 6 and 5. Didn't have to play two crazy minutes wise. Um, Jalen Williams was their second best with 21 a night. Chet Holmgren averaged uh, 15 and nine. But yeah, I didn't I didn't see it go on this easy for OKC, but it did. Credit to them. They handled business and they're, they're through to the second round. You know, Bogues, like Oklahoma City just sort of plays steady. You know, they have all those young guys, but they play they they play steady. And and it was what was was a wipeout 4-0. But like when you get Gildress Alexander, Jalen Williams, Holmgren plays well. You know, and then you get all those role players doing what they do. They really enjoy it. It's like they got that fire. They're different from Oklahoma City when they had Durant and those guys early on in their careers. You know, they were just they're they're not as ball dominant in my opinion, even though they got Shea. But the other guys, the ball moves a little bit more. They're a little, a little bit tough. They're a different team. I'm not saying necessarily better, but they're just different. And um, you know, I thought it was going to be more of a series. Uh, you know, they just didn't have enough, you know, especially with New Orleans playing with Zion at late in the season and how he was playing, like when, when he started getting in shape and the way they were playing, it, it is interesting. 
Uh, I guess we'll get into it a little bit later, but you know, it seems like Ingram and Valanciunas are going to be the fall guys there, and they're probably going to not be back from the team if you if you sort of listen to um, the talking heads sort of do what they do. But what's well, different? Um, the, the, the the roster pro like they've. Do you want to be a slower, get it to CJ ISO team or mm-mm. with the wings that you have, or should you be a run and gun? I thought their best basketball was last se- two seasons, or last season, not, not this past season, wasn't they just running with those wings and getting up and down? And then that was when CJ was hurt. And then you bring CJ in the fold. He's a slower, more get me the ball, I can break my guy down. Which team do you want to be? Their roster's kind of, you know, faceted two ways. The, the the Zion injury never injuries consistently come up and never help because he's part of that run and gun. I think they're better suited to having Ingram, Jones, Zion, like run and gun, move Valentunas for a more mm-hmm. kind of mobile big, send him somewhere where it's a bit more slower paced and just run and go. That's but they went away from that back towards part of it was the injury to Zion. Part of it is because ZJ is your number one scorer and he doesn't play that style of basketball. So that's what I find interesting with that squad. Yeah, to me, Bogues, I think in the off season, if I'm them, I'm I'm re- I'm I'm calling Phoenix every day, and my deal is going to be multiple picks, CJ McCollum, and your least favorable, either Trey Murphy or Herbert Jones, one of those two, and trying to get Booker back. You know, you never know. Look, there, you know, Phoenix needs to make a move, and they can't move Beal. Durant will won't get them as much value as you would think. So the only movable piece they got is Booker to sort of get them more assets back. And I, he's the I, youngest I'm piece, though, bro. Phoenix trade away the a- farm as far as Youngs go. I just Durant's mid thirties, Beal's pushing the same. But Booker's their only right. younger kind of asset left, right? Would would they even consider that? I would say no, especially how that owner talked in their in their press conference saying that all twenty nine, literally was basically saying they were the 86 Celtics and every team wants his roster, which he's very, very – I would have definitely checked his blood alcohol level after that speech that he gave in the in the presser. But to me, no. But if – you know, book um, Beal's got his no-trade clause. You can't move him. Durant, I wouldn't say he's unmovable. You can get something, but no one's really, you know, giving you the farm for him. The only guy that has true value that you could bring multiple assets back for because you're not dumping these guys. So like you're you're too high up in salary and you don't have enough talent. So the only way you could really do it is to get a combination of picks, a borderline all star, and a good young player. To me, Trey Murphy and Herbert Jones, you know, one of those guys, if not both, could be an all star throughout their career. Not multiple all stars, not great, great, great players, but they do have value. So to me, if I'm Phoenix and I'm looking and I'm saying, look, I can get. A guy, a guy who's yes a ball stopper but can score in McCollum. I can get a defender, either Jones or Murphy, that could both shoot the ball and they both could guard, and you know, and then I can get multiple picks. Something I would think about. But anyway, let's just go move on from the series. Look, it wasn't much of a series. I thought they were going to be do more with attacking Chet Holmgren with Valanciunas and, and really trying to rough him up a little bit and trying to get the the rebound and edge. They really couldn't find it. Game one. They really had their chance. They blew it. Then they were just sort of the window were out of their sails from games two, three, and four. So um, Oklahoma City moves on. Yeah, we'll move on to Phoenix then. Uh, Phoenix, Minnesota series, uh, touching on all that. Uh, Booker did average 27 and six in that series. Durant got his numbers 27 and six for him. They're both shooting good clips. Booker 50%, Durant 55%, both shooting okay from three. Bill wasn't great, um, 16 and a half at, at, at 44%. It he was, he was okay, but not great. And then just a fall off. I mean, Nurkic was relatively absent for most of the series. Eric Gordon was their fourth best scorer, which tells you what, what you need to know. No depth on the roster. With, with the way they've constructed this roster, they just don't have any depth or bench. Eubanks, Royce, o'ne- Royce O'Neal. The Grayson Allen injury did hurt them because I thought he was a key piece for them as far as a 3 and D guy, a role player, a guy that's got a bit of grunt to him on that wing that's happy to play a role. Bobo thought probably should have played a little bit more but didn't get that much of a look in, especially when you probably factor in the bigs of Minnesota. Countering that is probably putting Bobo at the five and Katie at the four for stretches, I think, and just trying to go super small and just rolling the dice. I mean, rolling the dice and trying anything then would be better than that 4-0 sweep, but they just got absolutely pummeled. 
uh, Anthony Edwards, 31 a night with eight rebounds and six assists on on 50% from the field and 44 from three. Towns obviously was was coming in, limping into that series a little bit, but 19 and nine was tremendous. Gobert, 15 and 11. McDaniels, 14 a night. Um, Alexander Walker, 12 a night. Conley, 11 and six a night. You know, Nas Reed, nine. They, just, they were so balanced in that series. And, and albeit, look, those numbers are probably inflated a little bit with, with their role players getting to double digits because they blew out Phoenix for most of these games. That was what was crazy. It was... It was just, you know, 120 to 95, 105 to 93, 126 to 109, and 122 to 116. Just for the most part, Phoenix just looked like I was sleepwalking out there, didn't want to be there. Um, we then obviously go into uh, Vogel being gone. Um, now, hey, in, in, in my Budenhoser, we trust five years, 50 million. Does he fix their problems? I don't think so. I mean, they just, they, they, that roster construction is just going to be the elephant in the room. You got three superstar players um, that are aging, um, that have injury histories. I mean, Katie's been relatively healthy, but still had the Achilles issue. Beal's been hurt. Booker gets his injuries every now and then. And then your role players around it. You know, they they need to they need to really hit their free agency out of the park as far as using the, the vet man and all that. But you know, I, I don't I don't see it. I think teams will look at you know those veteran guys will go to teams that are probably more favored towards a championship, which should be the Suns. They should have been in the mix, but just the roster construction's poor. And it goes to show you the the big three argument that sometimes works. This is what it looks like when it backfires. You get swept four nil. Now, credit to Minnesota too. I think uh, you know they're, they're 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 on a great run. They're well constructed. They're playing well together. A friend of mine. Pro actually was was spending spent some time with uh, Minnesota about about four or five days pre their playoff push leading into the playoffs in their playoff prep, and he said to me that he he was super surprised with how professional and diligent they were. He said their their practices were no nonsense. He said there was a confident. Uh, there wasn't cocky, but a confident air in the building of like, we're here to get our shit done and we can win a championship. And he, he just no, noticed it and sensed it and, and thought, shit, this is different to, you know, everything that you probably read and heard about Minnesota the last five years has probably been true, right? Like it was, it was kind of a shambles of an organization, the Jimmy Butler thing, the towns, whose team is it, all that kind of infighting, new ownership group. But he said it was, it was actually, you know, interesting to see that they were, they were, they were focused and he wasn't, he was, he said, I was not surprised they stopped the Suns because I kind of felt that they were in their element. It was, and he said, Conley has been the blessing to that. He said, Conley, just professionalism, the intangibles guy, the no nonsense guy. When he said he just led that, 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 those practices where it was just, everything was automatic and that they didn't, Coaches, you know, a lot of these NBA practices, sometimes you got to stop and redo drills because guys are kind of sleepwalking through it or you got certain targets to hit and shoot and drills. He said they just smashed everything out of the park like clockwork, like a well-oiled machine. So that that's just an interesting note as they go on. But how did you see this series? I guess we talk more Phoenix and Minnesota in this one. Yeah, it's just, look, in the beginning when they, when, they, when they made all the moves, I was a fan of it as far as getting the talent because it's really hard to get to acquire all-star level talent in this league. It, it, it really is. And look, Durant still had a lot of gas in the tank. Beal was a question mark, of course. And then you have Booker, you know, one of the younger, well, not even younger now, closer to, you know, to his, to 30, but, you know, one of the more explosive talents in the league as far as being a, you know, guy who could score, you know, break it down off the dribble and really do a lot with that. Um, obviously they came up short. Minnesota, one of the better teams you're gonna find at, at really trying to stop you and guard you. Um, you know, Phoenix just didn't didn't have enough. You know, I think with the injury with Grayson Allen really hurt them because it's another shooter, it's another player, it's another guy they could divert to. Um, you should have been good enough with Booker, Durant, and Beal to to win this series. But look, you know, Beal was hurt. You know, in the majority of the year, or well, a big part of it anyway. And they just weren't good enough, and, and they didn't do enough. You know, Minnesota credit Minnesota to their defensive game plan. They just never stopped attacking. They never stopped attacking on both ends of the floor, and Phoenix just didn't want it enough. You know, they just sort of when you get attacked in this league, 
you either could fight and fight it off and be like, okay, get punched in the face one game. We're going to make our adjustments. We're going to come at them. Here's what we need to do. Let's really attack this. And it just seemed like Phoenix really didn't do that. Nobody really stepped up to the, you know, to the challenge. Obviously you had your scores with Booker and Durant, but you know, you just didn't have enough. And, and, you know, their, their bench, we talked about it all year, just not, you know, not deep enough, didn't have enough weapons. And they, they really, they really didn't have a chance, especially after game one. You, you just got the sense that they were going to lay down. Vogel getting fired is a complete fucking joke. In this league, th- your coach is almost irrelevant, in, 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 in my opinion. It's your talent, how you construct your roster, what kind of character you have on that roster, and leadership. Look, the leadership role thing isn't as good as it. It will never get back to what it was you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Guys just, for the most part, aren't built like that. Minnesota's got multiple guys like that, but your roster's not like that. With your coaches, I think it can go two ways. You could bring in a championship-level coach to bring you over the edge you know, when you're right there. And I think that you're going to have a guy that, like a Thibodeau, that could clean you up. Like if you're not a good team, he can get you organized, he could push your players to the brink, and he could really up your level the best of his ability. If you don't have star talent, you're not going to win in this league. It's not one of those like Hoosier movies where, you know, everybody comes together, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a, like a, a great Disney ending. It doesn't happen that way. You know, not in the NBA. You need talent, you know, so your, your coach could either bring you over the edge or they could organize you and just sort of get you right. But your coach isn't going to do anything for you, really. It's not Vogel's fault. He's a very, he's well prepared, good coach. But look, someone's got to take the fall for it. And then I think, I think where we're going in this league where these players just shut off the coach if, if they're not getting what they want or, yeah, you know, they just shut them off or shut them down. They don't support them. It's tough. I mean, Vogel's been in, you know, two situations like that with the Lakers and now Phoenix. It's just where the league's going. And I think that, you know, some of these players got to really step up and stop the, stop the madness. With Phoenix in the offseason, it's going to be really hard to add talent to that team. You know, right now they're at like 186 million wise. They're in that upper tax apron. It's going to be really tough. Like when you're in that apron, you, you know, you basically don't have a mid level exception. It's really low and you can't really sign and trade players. It's really hard to acquire talent. As far as your trades, it's almost got to be equal. There's, they don't give you a lot of leeway with that. So it's going to be really hard. That's why I'm saying, look, Bradley Beal's totally untradeable. You know, I, I guess I can't be saying that because every contract's been tradable. You know, Westbrook was traded and a bunch of other guys with awful contracts, but he's almost untradeable. Durant's not going to bring you back a lot of, you know, a lot of talent back. So if you trade him Durant, what are you going to get for him? You'll get somebody who might be 60% as good as Durant. No one's giving you a really good young player for a guy in his mid thirties, sort of got a couple of really good years left. So no one's really giving you a lot for that. Booker's the only thing that they can trade, you know, going forward with, you know, to really bring them back either, you know, a lot of assets, you know, draft wise or young players or an all-star level player or a combination of the two or three. So that's going to be tough for them to really acquire and go forward. It seems like if you listen to the owner, they're going all in that everybody wants their roster. They're going to, you know, they're going to go forward with it. Boonhauser is a good coach. He's a, you know, he won a championship. He'll get you organized. That's great. No, but if they're going to shut him off on, on day one or mm. day two and not let him do what he does, I don't give a fuck how many plays you could call up, uh, ATOs, all that stuff, all those great you know, Malcolm Gladwell fucking sayings, uh, all those championship team building bullshit. All that shit's fucking meaningless unless your players are bought into it. You know, so I don't give a fuck what he says. So if they, they got to man the fuck up all those guys and say, you know what, if we're going to be together, we got to figure this thing out and stop blaming everybody. We got to start taking true accountability, not tweet out, uh, you know, all this accountability bullshit. They got to really look themselves in the mirror and figure things out because right now Phoenix can't make many moves. So it's going to be an interesting deal going forward. Yeah. And and you can tell a lot by the body language and, and obviously the bill, no high five to Vogel, all that kind of stuff, small stuff, but you can just see the way you know, they huddle and they get together and they communicate. It, it just didn't look good. It didn't look good from a team dynamic. I think you got three superstars who need to do a kumbaya in the summertime and get together and, and try to figure this thing out. Um, you know, Bud's been signed on a five-year deal. So 
the organization with that contract is subconsciously telling the players, this is our guy. We're not, we're not moving him. Um, so they better figure it out. LA, uh, Lakers versus Denver, 4-1 for, uh, for, for Denver. Um, Denver just too good. I mean, they just, they just were just too poised in that series. Um, you can see why LA was a playing team in, in some of these spots in the series, just the runs they allowed Denver to go on. Uh, 28, 16, and 9.8. So basically 10 assists a night for, for Jokic, 28, 15, and 4 for AD. LeBron, 28, 8, and 7. Murray, 23 and 7, but not not a great series for him. More so timely shots, hit some big shots for him. But the stat that everyone was talking about, Pro, was the Lakers led for almost 80% of this series. Um, and we sp- I spoke about it last week. I felt like they let a couple of games slip. They probably should have won um, in that series, but it just feels like you you get these matchups throughout NBA history that that one team just knows they're eventually going to win the game no matter what that other team does. That's the Lakers versus Denver. Like the Lakers can sometimes throw the kitchen sink at Denver. You don't see a panic. You just see Jokic kind of waddling down, getting to the high elbows and the high post, running a split action, making a tough shot off one. They just never seem panicked. Um, and – you know, they probably sh- – Lakers should have won game two. Even game one, potentially, should have won that one. And Denver just never panicked. They, they get this ton 4-1, get a bit of rest, and and now the Lakers blow their team up, and J.J. Redick might be the next head coach pro. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to be sitting there with popcorn w- watching that thing. That thing's going to be amazing to watch J.J. try to coach that team. Yeah, we'll talk about – I'll talk about it in a second, but, yeah, I, I, I do. Um, here's the thing. Again, it, it just comes down to talent. And look, you want a championship. They, they already know what it's like. They've been through battles and wars together. They got majority of the team together still from that last year's team. Um, you know, w- working with Kobe with their back-to-back championships, there were so many games they, they fell behind early, you know, even in, in a series. And they just sort of worked it out. They just sort of, you know, Kobe got to his spots. Omar Odom got to his spots. Powell got to his spots. And then they just figured they just grinded out most teams because A, they didn't panic. B, they had talent. And C, they were well organized. And it just seems like, you know, that's Denver. They're very well coached. They've got obviously a superstar player in Jokic. And they got all these other players that just sort of, you know, just sort of work their role. You know, I'm not a huge Jamal Murray fan. He does step up to the occasion. He's a great bad shot maker. And, you know, um, he turns it on when they need to, but he he was a little inconsistent, um, to be honest. But he he showed up and he showed up when they needed to. Didn't shoot the ball well again. Really tough, high, you know, low quality shots. But you know the guy's got the guy's got balls. He could definitely do what he does. With the Lakers, look, it wasn't a lack of effort for sure. It wasn't a lack of coaching. It was they just didn't have enough, and that's what the whole deal with this Laker team is. They don't have enough. Look, they. They built this roster to win a championship. They won one in, in, in what in the bubble, what in twenty. You know they did what they did, and they won a championship out of it. And that's what the goal is. It's really hard to keep these rosters in check, especially with the tax aprons. And you know I don't care if you're in a big market, small market, and, and sort of getting the right guys. You know, look, LeBron and AD are their guys. That's what they build around. And now they're just sort of trying to, you know, mismatch the roster the best they can to figure out what they're going to do. The problem is they don't really have that true third guy that could, you know, consistently lift your team. And it's tough, you know, getting that Middleton, like Middleton in Milwaukee. You know, he could play off of, you know, a Drew, a Giannis and Drew Holiday or Lopez. And he was a, a great player to have because he could really do it in, night in and night out. Russell's just not that guy. He's not a winning player. He's a talent, but he's not a winning player. He's not good for your locker room. He's not good for your team. He's not a consistent player. He can't really do it every night like that. Reeves is good. Don't get me wrong. Plays hard. You know, he comes at you. Again, I, just, I think he's a good player. Don't get me wrong. They just don't have enough talent. Um, you know, Dimwitty was a major disappointment. You know, since they got him in a tra- um, when they picked him up, not trade deadline, but they picked him up in free agency when he got waived. They just didn't do enough. Gabe Vincent was out well, all year. He was year. a useless pickup, in my opinion, bro. You got you got LeBron high usage. You got Russell high usage. Yeah. Ball in their hands. You still need to get Davis touches. Reeves comes in and makes an impact with his usage. It's like, why would you even you th- bother getting Dinwiddie? Like, it, it- I thought I thought he'd be good 
like a Chet Terry Off the second bench. unit sc- yeah. second unit scorer, you know, because he put up very good numbers in Brooklyn. And mm. then at the end of his regime there, his time there, it just didn't work for him. And then he, his stats, you know, stats just went to shit. And then he gets traded. You would think, all right, this is great. Come off the bench, do his thing. And he just never put it together, never put enough good games together for them. And that's the problem. It's not how they run. It's not Palenka's fault. It's, you know, the only thing I fault Palenka for is giving Zubac away for nothing to the Clippers. That's the only bad move, in my opinion, in doing the whole Westbrook thing. But, like, you know, he did a good job with his roster, did the best he could because, look, you, you're way over the cap. You can't really make a lot of moves. You had to re-sign Russell because that's who you went to war to get. You know, then you get Vanderbilt got hurt. He was a big part of your team late run la- you know, last year. Big time defender, energy guy. He's out. They just not, they're not good enough. And the whole JJ Redick thing, look, JJ's a brilliant dude. Could draw probably eight hundred ATOs. That's awesome. Sipping wine with LeBron. That's awesome. Nobody wants to coach LeBron James when he's on an average team midway through the year. He's you know, and just now you're going to see the real LeBron James. No offense to LeBron James. He's just he's at that stage where like you know, there's nothing else that could be done with his team. And he'll be grumpy, and all those great sessions they get on their podcast, and in the you know those brother moments, awesome. But now when you're not winning, <laughs> yeah. you know they're gonna point. They're gonna point to him, and yeah. he, you know, he's gonna find. You know, it's easy to be on TV and call out everything that's happening. Call out what you would do, what teams aren't doing. Oh, JJ won't do happen. that in a lot in an NBA locker room. Like he, he was no, he was you can't do. Of, he, you can't. And he was more of a yeah. kind of. Mm, politician with the way he went about things um in the locker yeah. room and as a head coach you can't do that you know you can't do that i've seen if, co- i've seen coaches try to do that come in and wear the wear the backwards hat and try to you know do all that kind of stuff and you just like like i feel like a respect level goes out the room with that and that's why i think you know it's a whole different ball game you gotta you gotta make hard decisions if, and, and and have you know tough statements to players at times to me jj's got three options a I'm going to leverage the, these head coaching jobs back to ESPN or whoever you know whoever mm-hmm. employs them and get a huge raise and sell yourself as the next Van Gundy, you know, and just be the mm-hmm. number one TV guy and keep going forward. Just put cotton in your ears when you know when you got to work with Doris Burke 50 times a year. <laughs> that's just, that's that's got to be brutal. The second thing he can do is just get a team, make his money, and, but he's made enough money, but get a payday and and, and just. And just deal with it. Or just don't, you know, take a knee right now. Don't take any job and wait to just keep on talking and doing your thing until there's enough buzz about you where you get a really good team. You know, that then like, you know, then if a really good team, you know how it is. If yeah. you know, every coach gets fired these days, get a good job that you got players like a Steve Kerr. Look, if Steve Kerr would be out of Boston Steve bombs Kerr out. Boston bombs out this season. Yeah. Starts off bad. You never know, right? Or, mm-hmm. or they just hired they they hired their top assistant to go to uh, Charlotte. Go to Boston as an assistant coach. Yeah. If that thing goes bad, you get the job. No doubt about well, it. I don't think he's doing um, the. I don't think he's going to do the assistant route. I think his his leverage and brand now is going to be big enough where he goes straight into a head nope. coaching spot, which which, which could hurt him, right? Like maybe yeah. it's a one and done thing. It's a Mark Jackson, right? Like it's it, it, it's just look. I don't care. Like I said, I don't care. How, there's a there's a ton of smart coaches. There's not a like a smarter coach than Rick Carlisle, right? And when Rick mm-hmm. Carlisle has got talent, he could win. When he doesn't have talent, it's hard hard for him to win right now he's got a bunch of guys with a great player that you know he's coaching up his ass and he's doing coaching his ass off doing a great job with that and they're overachieving no doubt but you just can't take a bad like if he took that charlotte job that that would be that would have been a laughing stock mm-hmm. because you know imagine him dealing with ball again it's all situational like steve kerr would be out of coaching if he took that Knicks job instead of golden state like, you know, Steve Kerr fell into a great situation. They were already rolling. That's a situation, again, it's once in a lifetime, but that's the situation JJ needs to be popped into. It is going to be a fucking disaster 
if he coaches that Laker team. Will they win 50 games? Probably. They'll probably win 42, 45, but like they got no chance of winning. And then you got to deal with LeBron James every day when he doesn't have a chance to win a championship. And LeBron James hasn't supported a coach since he's been in the league. I don't care about all these things that have been, you know, this guy, this, this player had so many coaches fired. I don't give a fuck about that. But the, what I look about Le- LeBron is who's he support? He's had one guy that actually had the balls to coach him in his whole career, all right, and that's Spolstra. And then everybody else tries, but he doesn't support him. Mm. And then, you know, I don't know if he's getting these guys fired. Obviously, you know, that they're probably going to run a lot of this, uh, uh, you know, across his desk. But it, it you know, well, I mean, Jay, they, went, he's to, not they su- went to the finals against us with uh, what was his name? They went back to Israel, Blatt. Uh, Blatt, yeah, and he was. Well, Blatt, no, Blatt, Blatt halfway through the year now. That was Ty Lue, though. But the season we beat them, uh, they, but they, the season we beat him, he was the head coach. Blatt was the head coach. Oh, that's and, true. And Lue yeah. took over the next year, right? But I'm just saying, he went to the finals. Yeah. You lost to a yeah. pretty good Golden State team at the time that ended up having a dynasty and getting KD and all that. And then you, right. that coach still wasn't good enough. So it goes back to your point. Like, you got rid of a guy that got you to the finals. It's like, all right, we're going to make this tweak. And you know, T. Lou was one of the boys and all that and ended up getting, getting the job and, and they got over the hump. So it, in hindsight, it worked out, but it's pretty yeah. harsh. You, you get the coach there, but um, let, let's keep it rolling. We're going to get through a lot more, sure. bro, but, uh, but yeah, I totally My agree. I, I would just love to see it from com- for comedic value and it gives give, oh. uh, you know, that whole, you won't be, you definitely won't be sipping wine together if you're coaching him, I don't think. Uh, final one in this uh, clip of the West was the Clippers in Dallas. 4-2 uh, for Dallas. I mean, the Kawhi thing's popped up again, injured, uh, didn't play many games in this series. I think he played, what did he play, three or four? Uh, he played two games in this series for 30 minutes, knee swelled up, had to have it drained, couldn't play again. Uh, what I was really impressed with Dallas was, and I spoke about this, even though I didn't pick him, spoke about him uh, pre this series, was if Kyrie and Luka can get their defense just up to an average to above average level, they're very tough to beat. They did that this series. I think they were really impressive. Luka was really impressive for the most part. Uh, Kyrie's been really good defensively, just solid. You know, they got some deflections that just stayed in front of their guys. Uh, Luca wasn't a turnstile, and, the, and and it made life hard on on Harden, Paul George, and those guys. Um, Harden was twenty one mm-hmm. five and eight, Luca thirty nine and nine, Kyrie twenty and uh, twenty six and five. Uh, Paul George kind of somewhat disappeared later in this series. Um, it was nineteen six and five, but I was really impressed with their defense. And Dallas seemed like they're Starting to figure out, you know, the lay of the land of, of what's going to get them into the promised land potentially, and I think yeah, just big credit to, to Luca and Kyrie. Obviously, not not known as great defenders, and just just bought in to be at least solid. That's all they need. All you needed for them, just don't be a turnstile. Just be solid for us. Funnel those guys to a lively, to a Gafford, who are great shot blockers. Box out, get the rebound, we're out running, and, and they did a fantastic job there. But I mean, for the Clippers, pro, the, we, it seems like. This is a conversation we have every May. <laughs> it's the same one. It's like, where's who from here? It's your big three, spend all this money, damn good roster, right? Like, does Tilu get the pass again? This is, a, this is. I mean, the Ka- Ka- Kawhi injury doesn't help, but even during the regular season, they were up and down. The, the, the Harden trade happened. They had that bad run, and they got good again, and then towards the end, they sputtered a little bit again. I mean, this is a still a decent roster. Some really good pieces. Norman Powell, great six man. Zubats, really good big um, center in in our league. Good backups in Plumlee and Highland and PJ Tucker, obviously phasing out with age. Westbrook's there. Terrence Mann was really sol- solid for him. Amir Ko- Kofi comes and plays out of nowhere. Starts playing big minutes in the series, you know. So decent roster, but but where to for them, pro? There's not a lot they can do. But is this a case of moving on one of those big three for for some pieces, a la kind of what you did with Phoenix? Well, Bogues, I think right now they're they're sort of on the on the books to to go forward with this thing. You know, they signed they signed Kawhi to an extension. Um, right now, they're trying to get Paul George to do the same. Um, they've already sort of made their bed with this team, and you know the Kawhi injury thing. Look, man, I mean. From what I was told in in Toronto, it took every fiber there being to keep him on the court, and he's he's had a problems, you know, finishing you know finishing seasons. It's tough, man. It's tough. They're, I'm sure he's doing everything he can, and I'm sure the team's doing everything they can. 
And right now, they made their bet. They traded SGA and a ton of draft picks, you know, to to bring in Kawhi, you know, to bring in Kawhi, you know, get Paul George and and, and do what they have to do. And it's just for them, it's going forward with this team, you know, signing you know, Paul George. Right now, right uh, this year, they were at around two hundred and five million. Which uh, I I want to see that tax bill, man. I mean, the guy is one of the richest people on the planet. I, I'm sure it's nothing to him, but yo, know, next year they're at one seventy five, yo, know, salary wise. And then let me check real quick if that's even including Paul George. Um, so Paul George, Paul George has a team uh, has a player option. So that's like yeah, three million, I mean, right? Yeah. I, I, it's like 48 million. Yeah. So 49. So obviously he's going to re up, you know, they're going to have to sign him. I don't know because they're so high. I don't know what they can do to sign and trade. I don't think they could sign and trade. They don't allow you to when you're that high up. So I just think you go forward with this roster and, and you have to, you're opening Roll up an arena next year. You know, there's, there's a ton of, I, I don't think with Ty Lu, I don't think anything really falls on him too much because of the Kawhi thing. Kawhi's hurt. You know, look, Kawhi played eighty percent of his games this year. Paul George played ninety percent of his games. That's a unbelievable improvement from the years past. They kept him healthy to a certain degree, and then it just sort of fell to shit at the end. Um, but that's just sort of where they're going. You know, they, I think they're just going to re-sign Paul George, run it back, maybe sign a couple of minimums. Westbrook was a complete zero, in my opinion. Offen- like he he had great effort, but he 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 really gave them nothing offensively. The shooting, you know, that's what under I just can't understand, folks. You you ha- you make all this money, right? You have these off seasons. Look, he's on the he's sort of on the tail end of his career. I get it. You know, he's not a young guy anymore, but. Like, spend time in the summer to get your shot right. Not turn into Steph Curry. But, you know, it's just the sh- the lack of shooting from Westbrook is, you know, 26 from the field, 23 from the three, 61 from the line. I mean, he's the bizarro. He's the fucking bizarro Steve Nash. You know, it's unbelievable. He's like on the bottom level on all those three numbers instead of the top. Like, that's... You know, because he could be a big role guy for this team because of the energy he plays with, you know, but he just can't, he's a zero offensively, can't make shots. Norman Powell stepped up. I like Zubach. I like, you know, I like Plumley. But if if you can't keep Kawhi healthy, you're done. And you sign him to an extension. So you're done with that. And I don't think anybody's giving you much back for, he's sort of like, you know, the whole Durant thing. I'd probably give you more for Durant than I will for Kawhi because of the health thing. Yeah, for sure. You know, but anyways, uh, this series, look, I agree with you. I, I think Luca when he's engaged, Steve Sweeney, uh, Sean Sweeney from the Dallas Mavericks is one, of, I think, is one of the most underrated assistants in the league. Defensively, he's locked in. You know, he, he's got great schemes. He, you know, he gets to those guys. He's probably been their best defensive coordinator they've had in 15 years there. And he does a great job. He's locked in. He locks those guys in. And I think, you know, we'll talk about it in the next series, but Kyrie... I, I was really impressed with Kyrie playing more off the ball and more facilitating versus just trying to score. You know, averaging under 20 shots a game for this series. Obviously, Luca does, you know, even though his, like, you know, Luca had a big time shooting slump in the series. I agree with you. He's walked in defensively. He argued calls, but not as demonstrative as he usually does. I thought he was more locked into that. You know, more communicating with the referees. Of course, he complains, but not to the to the level that he did. I thought Maxi Kleber played great. Um, you know, he got injured, but I thought you know Gafford and Lively was were good. PJ Washington, we'll talk about in the next series. Mm-hmm. Didn't play as well in this series, but obviously a huge part of the, the next series. But I think Dallas is um, they're going to be a tough out. I agree. All right, moving on to the next round, we'll go through these quickly. Uh, we are in the semifinal. So Nick's pace is currently 2-2. Uh, a lot going on um, in that series. It, it's kind of um, a very swingy series. Uh, injuries have, have played their part, Pro. I know Thibs is your guy, but I mean, I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at minutes played, man, and, and it comes back to bite Thibs almost every playoff. I mean, he has – I know everyone's going to say Josh Hart, the Josh Hart quote, we're paid to play basketball – but the level and intensity of these games aren't regular season games. These are intense, hard, grind-out games, and you hate to see injuries play their part. 
um, and Ananobi goes down with that hamstring. As soon as he did it, I'm like, man, like they just pl- he plays his starters so much, and they're all mid to high forties, and they just you know Josh Hart back to back forty eight minute games. I mean, he's healthy, but that's all it takes. And and look. I'm not all in with the research and the GPS data, but you got to buy into it a little bit. And if you can buy a player a couple of minutes here and there, I think you have to do it. You know, Brunson's banged up. Um, you know, uh, Mitchell Robinson's out. You know, he's been out for the last three games. Now they got to play other guys. They got to play guys that haven't been in the rotation. Sims is getting minutes. Milton, uh, Jeffries, you know, um, Burks has cracked the rotation. You know, Bogdanovich is obviously out from the regular season. So th- that is ruining its head for them. I think that's advantage Indiana, obviously, because they play so deep. They, they, they play such a high tempo, which then forces Carlisle to have to go 9, 10 deep at times. And bringing guys like, you know, TJ McConnell is playing really well, Toppin, uh, Nembard, you know, Nes- Naismith. You know, they've got a lot of different guys they can bring in to provide minutes for them because they go on at such a high pace. Even McDermott's cracked the rotation, albeit garbage time, but they've gone deep. And it's been a fun, swingy series to watch. Um, I just I just hope New York can be somewhat healthy. I don't see um, OG being back. I just don't see you coming back from a hamstring within two weeks. I just don't, even if it's a strain, the risk versus reward for them to bring him back this quickly, you could tear it off a bone, right? You just don't want to risk that hamstrings and calves. As we know in this industry, pro, I just you can kind of get by a knee to an extent, a little bit, or a little bit of a quad if you're strong enough in the weight room. Hamstrings and calves are just brutal. That full sprint just goes out. So um, it's been a fun series so far. I mean, DiVincenzo has been playing balls out. I mean, twenty three point eight, uh, four rebounds, two assists. Brunson twenty nine, five assists. His clips uh, not. Like not not as good. He's twenty eight percent from three, forty seven percent from the field. He's getting it done from the free throw line, averaging nine a game. Um, Josh Hart has been pretty pretty good again, thirteen and twelve with five assists. Uh, Harden's time has been solid, but then yeah, Indiana Halliburton's found it this series. He's found the shot. Uh, he's twenty three, seven and five, forty five percent from three. So a, a lot to do with yeah, that one game where he hit five or six of them. Everything to do with his game. If he knocks it down a couple of those threes, he gets on those streaks, he can make four or five in a hurry. Uh, Miles Turner has been pretty good at 15 and six, and Siakam 18, 18 and six. TJ McConnell, who you spoke to earlier, he's been really good in this series so far. 12 points, six assists, six six point five to one point five turnover. So for all you guard listeners, that's a really good ratio there. You know, pretty much four four and a half to one. Uh, he's been good for him and top and average and ten and Nembard with. Top in 12, Nembard 10. So, swingy series, Pro, who, who do you have from here? Um, knowing what we know with injuries, knowing where the lay of the land lies, who are you picking as your team? I'm going to pick the Knicks, and I, I'm probably going to lose it. But <laughs> Way to be here's confident. My, what's up? Way to be confident in your pick. Here's, what, here's the reason why. Look, look. I think for Indiana, it's a battle of attrition, right? All you got to do is it just keep going until these these guys stay minutes go up and up and up. <laughs> yeah. Right, just stay healthy yeah, a- until yeah. somebody else doesn't. And look, they're they're down to so many few players with, with New York. Here's the thing: they should have won Game Three. You know, New York should have won Game Three. You, if you saw that. Um, Siakam bear hug on Hartlestein at the end. You know where where that was a definite foul. Now look, Indiana was complaining about a lot of calls because get the series is physical and a bunch of blown calls their way. They should have gone their way. I understand that. But two things I think that will give New York a, a chance besides Thibodeau and their toughness and Brunson and all that stuff, that they should have won game three, even without OG, which gives, gives them a little life. Them getting blown out. I thought they were going to, I thought they were going to just give up and, and take a knee in game three anyway, but they didn't. They went all in for it, and they should have won. But game four getting blown out really helps them, in my opinion, because they rested a lot of those guys. They 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 cleared the bench finally. See, I think – look, I'm never going to question the guys coaching in, 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 in some respects. I think Burks and McBride should have been playing, sprinkling in minutes here and there. Mm-hmm. A, gives them some rhythm. B, gives them some reps just in case they got to play some minutes you know, in, in certain situations, but they didn't. I think that they could win this series. That It'll be an ugly win, and I just don't know how they could do it. Brunson's, you know, Brunson's got a sprained foot, but they do play hard. They do play together. It's just one of those things, man. It, it just... I'm probably going to lose, like I said. I don't have a lot of faith in it. But game three should have won. 
And the fact that those guys got a little bit of a break game four gives me a little bit of a hope with that. But look, it, not to take away from what Indiana's doing. Indiana, they, you know, they're coming at them, playing hard, making shots, attacking, and they're getting to the basket a lot easier than they were, you know, early in the series. Because again, they're just, ba- they're just, you know, as these minutes keep going up and up, you know, New York gets more and more tired. But I think if, you know, especially if they can take game five, I think New York's going to be a tough out. But who the fuck knows? You know how I am with picking. I'm pro, you know, yeah. I would bet heavily against what I'm well, saying. The, 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 but I'm, the Knicks will be ready to play. There's no doubt about it. Things will have him ready. Yeah. He's diligent with his scouts. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be that. Do they, do they allow Indiana to get on those, you know, 10 0 runs and, um, you know, 15 to 5 spurts where Indiana can get to 121 points or even 111 or 121? Or do they keep yeah. it in the low 100s? Then it's, 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 it's ball game for the Knicks, right? I, I think the injuries are going to play a part. I think the, the OG out is huge. I mean, he's had a great offensive yeah. series. Um, he, yeah. he, you know, he's known for his defense and everything he does defensively. Um, but he's 20 a night with six rebounds, you know, and, and, and their best defender. Um, you're losing 20 I mean, points a night. Where do you get it back from? You're not getting it back from no matter how much you'd like to – Achua, but, Jeffries, Milton, Sims, like you're just not going to get enough offense back from those guys over the course of three games. Folks, they're giving up about – they they're missing about 70 points in offense, um, about 22 rebounds a night, OG out. Randall out, yeah. Bogdanovich out, Bogdanovich, Robinson yeah. out. And doing, I mean, getting man, it's getting crazy. crazy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. it's – but this is a, also a case of even if they do get through to the next round, you know, banged up as they no. are, playing no, the minutes Boston. that they are. Yeah, I know, but I would have liked to have seen if either of these teams, Indiana or New York, I just don't want injuries. I want to see a good series in the conference finals. And I think New York healthy – one thing I, I saw, Draymond had a friend of mine, Jason, on his podcast talking to the Knicks, and that you know the, the, their theory was that they they think this they're playing better without Randall, and I'll probably agree with that. I think yeah. the ball moves better. They concentrate on going through Brunson, so I would love to see this Knicks team fully healthy, bar Randall, um, going into a conference finals. I think they could definitely wake up the Celtics because you're not gonna you're not gonna cruise control through a healthy New York um, like you are these other couple of teams. But anyway, that's, that's neither here or there. But yeah, I think, if, I think Indiana, I, I think the, mm-hmm. I think the, you know, the injuries are going to, are going to take their toll on the minutes. And I think the room for error is so much smaller now for New York and the injuries are going to come into play over a seven game series. I think one other thing I know, noted in this pro, which you don't see a lot in the NBA is both teams are picking up full court. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've noticed this in this series. New York uh, have a targeted effort of trying to slow down the pace of Indiana by picking it up at the point. Literally three-quarter court, Halliburton catches it. He can't just throw it up the court down the sideline and get running. Um, they've done it where the Bucks did a horrible job of that. And on the other side of the ball, Pacers are doing the same thing to Brunson and Hart. They're, they're really pressuring. So you see it a lot in the NBL. You see a lot of full-court pressure and – grind up the floor and try to wear guys down. You don't see it a lot in the NBA. Um, teams just don't do it much. These two teams are both doing it to each other, and I've, I've liked that adjustment by both of them because it both has different errors. Obviously, Indiana aren't trying to slow down New York because they're slow. They're trying to wear down Brunson and Hart and take their legs out, so hopefully at the end of the games they don't have their legs, whereas New York are doing it more for we want to slow their offense down and make them play in the half court because we don't think they're as good in the half court. So that's been interesting in this series, bro. I think every guard should do that, Bogues. Every point guard on the planet, high school through pro, should be doing that. Trey Jones, my client that plays for starting point guard for the Spurs, every scouting report, I'm like, pick this guy up full court, full court, full <laughs> yeah. court. Yeah. It's not to get steals. It's to wear them down. Like if you do that – it frustrates them, first of all. You might be able to get a deflection or two, but it's more like it's annoying. the fourth quarter. And it's annoying. Yeah, it's annoying like, as fuck. you got to make him cross over three or four times. If, if it's a Kawhi, or yeah. that, that's more load on the knee. And it's just because no one does it, it's kind of a shock at yeah. times. Like, hey, what, what the hell are you guys doing? Get back to, you know. And I'll tell you this. If New York gets to the uh, conference final and Boston doesn't beat them, if I'm ownership, I'm sending one through 17 and my whole coaching staff to fucking the Beijing and they're going to be playing for the Ducks next year. If you can't beat the Knicks 
what, what, you know, with your full fledged team, even minus Porzingis, and you can't beat the Knicks, you're all coaching and playing in fucking Beijing next year. Mark it down. The uh, yeah, the Boston Dragons or something like that. Yeah, fair yeah. point. I mean, yeah. yeah, like like I said, the, the the you know, and then Indiana's a whole different ball game if they get through. But I think Indiana in this one will 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 yeah. will take it just because of the injuries. Uh, Boston, Cleveland, th- just finished three one. Cleveland win this. No Donovan Mitchell mm-hmm. out with a calf. Um, but Boston were, 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 were staring down the barrel a little bit. Cleveland played very, very well, but some questionable calls throughout that game, um, according to our friend Trent here. They just, just thought the, they were a little bit hard done by the old Cavaliers. Uh, but 3-1, I mean, look, no one really thought Cleveland would, 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 would threaten Boston, uh, especially with Mitchell out now. I thought they'd get two. Um, doesn't look like they'll, they'll do that just because I think Boston still, like we said, they sleepwalk at times. You know, they completely sputtered in game two on their home floor. To go down 118-94 at home in game two was pretty embarrassing for the Celtics. They have bounced back since. Donovan Mitchell, 31-6-5. and five. Tatum, 27-10-5.5 and five and a, half a night. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is this is going 4-1. You know, you'd hope Boston wake up and say, hey, let's make, you know, 4-1 at home. We take that game, get some rest. But it is Boston. They could make this somehow a six-game, seven-game series because it's oh, what they geez. do. I don't see them losing yeah. the series. But it wouldn't surprise me if they lost game five. It's always those It's always those games where you're just like, oh, series is over. Going back to Boston, they'll get some rest. And then it's like, shit, we're talking about game six. <laughs> it's just that's been the Celtics the last four years. But uh, I think pretty much a box tick series. Um, Cleveland just, just not enough, especially with the injuries. I think um, Mobley's been pretty good in this series since they moved him to the five because because of uh, Allen being out. I think he's done a pretty good job. He's 18 and 10 with three assists. You know, really attacking Horford off the dribble and trying to go by him and and, and, and done his growth has stepped up. He's still a very young player. Garland was really good today. Um, but Cleveland, I think, have been okay. But yeah, Boston just too deep, bro. Yeah, especially if Donovan Mitchell is going to miss multiple games. If he's going to miss next game, it's going to be tough. But today was tough. You know, it's typical NBA, right? You, the, your opponent's best players out. You sort of take them a little lightly and they come, they come for your throat and you take them lightly and they jump you a little bit. And that's sort of what happened. Look, they took one, one game in the series. I don't know if they'll take another one, but it is Boston. You never know. Um, I'm with you with with the whole Mobley thing, they posted up switches. Some, you know, they flashed him the high post and had him attack off the dribble. He's, you know, again, you, I do like the playoffs because players like that tend to really make a jump in their development, especially when their reps go up. And without a, without Jared Allen, he's got to sort of have an elevated role. Some guys do well like him. Some guys don't like Hero when their ele- when their role gets elevated. It it is pretty fun to watch. I'm not a huge Cleveland fan. I love JB Bickerstaff, but just like watching them play, there aren't many guys I really like. Donovan's okay. I like Mobley, Garland. I, you could take him or leave him. You know, Struess is good because he could shoot. Um, but yeah, yeah, you'd expect Boston to sort of sleepwalk through it, which they have been, but you expect them just to sort of take the series away. I expect them probably to win four one, but again, Tatum, there was another stat bugs that, um, coming into this game before this game, um, if you counted the threes taken by Tatum from last year, from the Miami series where they lost to this year in the playoffs, he's taken 88 threes, not counting a night. How many threes do you think he – actually, I'm sorry, after game two in this series, throughout the whole playoffs, he took 88 threes. How many, you know, how many do you think he made out of his last 88 threes, not counting a night, not counting the last two games? How many did he make? Yeah, out of 88. 17. 22. Yeah. And that's one thing, look, you know, every there's always a story, right? Look, the guy's a, an, in my opinion, an elite scorer. I don't think he's an elite shooter. I think he's an elite scorer. And he's a very, at times, low percentage player because he goes into a little bit too much of an isolation game instead of making it simple, which is weird because, I mean, he could score easily. So yeah, he's so long and a, athletic. Yeah, he can get to his spots. Yeah, he, he just settles for that a, step back a lot. Yeah. I love, again, I love Holiday. I love White. You know, I love watching those guys. I love Horford, even Cornette, Hauser. You know, those guys play hard and they play well. And look, Brown and Brown and Tatum, excellent players. Don't get me wrong, uh, unbelievable players. But it just, uh, just not enjoyable to watch for me. But mm. 
you know, it, they're going to win this series. They should get to the finals. Um, I would think that, like, I think Indiana, I, I mean, New York would probably be too shorthanded. I don't expect OG to play again. Um, they're not getting anybody back. So I don't think they're going to really be able to really stop them in a series. They might be able to take a game because of toughness. I'll tell you what, you can't sleepwalk on Indiana, though. If Indiana gets to those conference finals, don't sleepwalk on them because those guys are going to attack. One thing about a Carlisle coach team, especially with guys like this, that they'll attack to the very end. They may not be able to guard you, but they will attack you and put pressure on you to guard them. And if they keep their head above water and they stay in the game for three and a half quarters, anybody's ball yeah. game. Yeah, and Indiana just runs a helter skelter style of play that that you know they're trying to really push the pace, the tempo. And Boston's not trying. Boston's got a higher pace, but nothing compared to Indiana. So it would be interesting to see. I think either of them would be. Just an interesting matchup for Boston because they'll have to they'll have to at least show up and make sure they're locked in uh, for the full full game and full series. All right, uh, Denver and Minnesota, uh, swingy series. I mean, both both teams haven't won a game on their home floor. Um, two two, uh, so road wins for both teams. Denver never out of the series, which I mean, it was just funny watching. You know, they're still a defending champion and they got a heart of a champion, and then they go down 0-2 and everyone's writing them off completely. Um, you know, Jokic twenty six or twenty seven, eleven and eight. Edwards thirty three, five and five, and and just just the manner that I think Minnesota came out and absolutely, you know, played real well in game one, but then punched them in game two, just just smacked them off the floor. The game was over pretty. Felt like it was over at halftime. Um, you were waiting for a Denver run, but it just never came. Um, but no, no Gobert in game two. Uh, they win that game. I knew as soon as Denver, I knew they win game three. As soon as Denver win game four, I knew it was Rudy was going to be the scapegoat by the media. And bang, you got Stephen A. Smith. You go get him out of the lineup. It's like, well, you know, he's a main reason why they're there. Um, should they tweak the minutes? Who knows? But I just, I, I just, whether it's right or wrong, I knew that would be the rhetoric because because Gobert was not wasn't great last night um, in, in stretches and made some 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 crucial errors. But I knew that would be the scapegoat. But you got you got Towns with eighteen and eight. You got Reed with twelve, Conley with ten. Go Bernie's to obviously his scoring's not great this series. Um, he's at seven and ten uh, rebounds, but just the the way the way Denver did it these last two games winds you back to that run conference finals, the finals of last season. They just they're just slowly grinding. They throw it down to Jokic. He's 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 just he's amazing down there. He's he's fun to watch. Um, amazing footwork makes the right play. Uh, Murray, we spoke about off air, just just being able to hit tough, tough shots um, throughout periods of this game. His, his numbers aren't great. He's, he's, compared to what he's usually putting up, he's 17 points at 40%, 35 from three. But just his degree of difficulty on some of those shots, Gordon's been really good. I mean, he was 10 for 10 at one point last night. I think he finished 12 for 14, whatever he was. Edward snick it out. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Edward for 12. Edward snick it at him, walking out of the press conference, which I you know – Jury's out on whether that's the right decision, but he's been really big. I mean, seventeen and four, and and just just a guy that's bought into that being that third fourth wheel and being the right spot and, and taking his opportunities when he gets them. So he's a guy that teams have picked on with being a dare guy from three. We're not going to respect you offensively, um, and he's had his moments, good and bad, throughout the playoffs. But I think he's he's an integral part of them moving forward. Porter Junior with thirteen and a half, but uh, call it from here, pro. It's two two. We're going back to Denver. Who you got winning this one? I'll go with Denver. I'm going to go with my original pick. I'm going to go with Denver. I, look, I jumped off the bandwagon quick. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it, it seemed like very much they got taken to, you know, Edwards was obviously the head of the snake with that one and just attack and attack and attack and attack. And, and Denver had nothing to show for it. Jokic looked tired after game one, seemed like he was doing everything. And, he, and it just, it's not enough. And Jamal Murray was hurt. I didn't think that was going to get better. You know how these injuries are, Bogues, especially deep in the playoffs. You, you just don't expect these guys to really heal. Now, I don't know if he went down to Mexico and, and saw some witch doctor or something, but, you know, and, and you know, re you know, got re re energized. But the guy really showed up in game three and game four. And, you know, I, I didn't expect that. I expect him to digress and it just didn't have enough. Porter Jr. needs to be like the fourth option. He needs to be a guy that the ball gets swung to, you know, catch and shoot, straight line drive. He's not a guy that you just go to and just create offense. So 
you know, with Jokic doing all the work and then them just sort of throwing doubles and being physical. And, you know, it was literally like prison ball. And we haven't talked about that enough. And not that I want to start this conversation, but, you know, it's been really physical in the playoffs, and mm-hmm. which I love. Especially this series. I, I really love this series, very much yeah. so. Yeah. Th- this series in the Indiana series has been the most physical I've seen in five years. You know, they, it's just physical. And it's great to see. Uh, but I think it, I think Denver is sort of – not that they're soft or anything, but I think they caught them a little off guard because Minnesota was kicking the – I mean, they mm-hmm. were really – you know, up, yeah. They were cheap shotting the fuck out of them, and it is what it is, and, that, and that's just sort of what happened. But, look, no one else was really stepping up. Murray, um, you know, Murray was, was a shell of himself. Gordon was good but not great. Porter was just okay. They were just – nobody was stepping up. KCP was banged up. Reggie Jackson was a little banged up. They couldn't get much off, off from scoring. Peyton Watson, who was a good defender during the year, you can't really play him because he can't score. On the other side of the ball, Anthony Edwards, this is his coming out party. You know, the, the guy's an elite player. In my opinion, he's, a, a, in my opinion, top five, you know, just because mm-hmm. of the fact that what he's doing. I mean, he comes at you on both sides of the floor. He could score. His shooting, even though it's not great, it's elevated in this in the playoffs. In this series, he's shooting about 44%. Um, but he's just a go-to guy that just carries you on his back and he keeps on coming. The problem is they don't have enough guys that could consistently do it every night where they could be dominant. After game two, I made the statement that they could win this thing because of their domination on defense and not only Edwards being able to score 30-plus, but guys like Towns could step up. If it's not Towns, you know, Conley gives you a little bit. You know, Nas Reed gives you a little bit. It's just... The question for me, you know, and, and look, uh, you know, uh, Jaden McDaniel has been unbelievable defensively. Alexander Walker has been very good defensively. Kyle Anderson doing his thing. But I just don't know if they have enough offensively. Somebody's going to talk to Carl Anthony Towns and say, look, it takes you an hour to make minute rice. You're not very bright. It's, o- it's okay. You step up in games but then you have monumental games where you just, when you try to think and do too much, you're not built for that. You fuck our team up. You've been very good. You, they say he was the best shooter in the in, in the playoffs from three. Uh, I do believe it because that's what they say number wise. But like you have to know when and when not to do things, especially defensively. You have to stay solid defensively. You have to be that second scorer for Edwards when they double off and just to make shots and make easy plays. When you try to get too much, first of all, he travels every fucking time he drives it. Watch his footwork, you know, and they don't call it, but it, that's, it is what it is. But they don't have that consistent second scorer, in my yeah. opinion, where I think Denver will take that. They'll just pick them apart at times. And they just don't have enough. But I'll tell you what, those first two games defensively, it was a clinic. They're probably the more, one of the more dominating defensive teams in the last 15 years of what they can do with guys switching, guys could guard, they could protect the rim. Yeah, Rudy didn't play, you know, they, they didn't play, they won. And like you said, he's a little bit of a scapegoat, but he's made some elite defensive plays. Yeah, he's a liability at times, but he is elite at times. I just I think need Denver's bodies. Gonna... You need bodies for Joker. Like regardless of what people think, yeah. you you cannot. Yeah. Win. All right, let's let's bench Rudy. You, you're going to play no. Towns on Jokic for 40 minutes, ta- uh, and with with a bit of read, he's going to eat you alive. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. What what were Jokic's numbers? He's at uh, 26, 11, and eight with three big guys alternating on him. I mean, fuck. Like you and- take away Rudy, that that's 35, 15, and whatever, right? So. I think you need Rudy out there. Can they tweak it at times late in games because of the free throw thing and all that? Maybe a little bit, but he's he's got to play his 30 to 35 minutes. The reason why Minnesota's here is because he's your five. He's a defensive player of the year. People argue yep. that, but their defensive numbers don't lie. Um, yeah, he looks goofy at times. Yeah, he says some stupid things, but he's a big part of part of what they do. I agree with you on the on the second second scoring option. It has to be Towns. Uh, Conley, yep. I'd like to see a little bit m- more productivity from him maybe, but he was 15, nine assists with – with uh, no turnovers, so solid yeah. from him. Nas Reed, probably a better punch off the bench. But Edwards, I, I'm, he's the best two-way player in the league by far. Um, mm. His defense this, this playoffs has been sensational. And I think kind of – I don't know who you'd have before him. Beal was in the conversation because Beal was really made his mark. Before he jumped offensively, he was a all-league defender and then was one of the best two-way guys but didn't really kind of influence – 
his teams to go deep or be deep winners. Edwards, I mean, the way he plays well, on both ends of the ball is amazing. He's, he's got that intensity. So I'm going to go with Denver as well just because I think the I think they've stolen the momentum back in this series. I think it's going seven. I think it's going to be a grind out, and I think Denver win it in Denver yeah. game seven. Yeah, with Gordon too with the role. I remember when he got acquired, you and I had a long conversation about that on the pod. And we were worried about it because I think he was worried about losing, being a number one guy on a bad team and mm-hmm. going to that team. But he's got to understand that like, he's got one of the best passers in NBA history, going to make his job a lot easier, and he'll be a much more an efficient player. I haven't looked up his numbers, but I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing his efficiency with – you know, not getting double teamed every night like he was in Orlando he's because he was their best player. He's made comments on it. He said, you know, yeah. stuff along the lines of if, if our best player can can make the right play and not have to shoot 20 shots, I've got no excuse. I've got to make the right play. And Malone's even complimented him on that. And I think he's – credit to him, man. He was the number one guy. It's hard to go from being a number one it guy. Is. You know, the, the spotlight's on you and everything goes through you to like, hey, you're third, fourth, maybe fifth on some lineups. Um, if it's yeah. Porter Jr. and Murray and – you know, they all have it going. So tr- a, a tremendous amount of credit to him. He's born into a role. He's a champion. He's got a chance to go two piece. He's so, physical. He yeah. plays hard. They're playing him in the dunker more. So they can't afford watch to do it too. Game. They can't afford to do it because Jokic shoots threes, right? You can't, if you had Gordon with a team like the Clippers, you can't play that lineup. It just doesn't work. So yeah. it has to be a specific roster, but, but finish your point. No, I mean, they're playing him more in the dunker. Those guys are driving, you know, the defense collapses and they've been finding him late. I think he's being more physical. I think they got to be, they, they got away from that. I think that, you know, Jokic got to take less threes and just really like drive them, drive them, dump off, drive them, score, drive and kick and just be able to move Minnesota a little bit Mm. more versus, you know, Murray taking these tough, tough shots. You got to live and die by him, but it'll be a good series. I think, I think Denver will win in seven. Okay. And and in game four, it was noticeable. They put uh, Rudy on Gordon um, because Gordon's closer to the hoop. Jokic was in that short role and Gobert was not stepping up because he knew that lob was coming. So what, what, what happens next? Jokic was just killing him with that mid-range floater, that that floater from the dotted line. So uh, really good. All right, OKC okay, in the Thunder. At time of recording, this game is ongoing, so we don't really know the result yet. But uh, at halftime, it's 54 to 43 for OKC, uh, for, for Dallas, apologies. Um, this one has kind of, I mean, I, 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 I had OKC, it's it's come down to a battle of the roll bigs versus pop bigs. You got Chet Holmgren, who's not as physical. He's more of a pop guy, more of a finesse guy, versus the the two headed monster of Lively and uh, and Gafford, who are doing a fantastic job this playoffs, especially with everything going on. I think um, SGA thirty one ten and seven before game four. Luca twenty three ten and seven. The third star, which you mentioned earlier on, you want to talk about. Um, that's key for Dallas. You know what Kyrie's going to give you. You know what Luca's going to give you. Those role guys are combining for I think it's roughly twenty five and fifteen a night, or, or twenty four and twelve a night when you when you factor in Lively and uh, Gafford's numbers on an average basis. Um, but Hardaway and Washington. So the, the games they've won in this series, they had one where Hardaway went off off the bench, and the other one, you know, Washington has good games. They generally win. I think you know Giddy's been benched, so from an Australian point of view, there are some some kind of siren bells ringing for, you know, get his confidence and, and he, he d- does not look as confident as he did in the regular season. He just, he's kind of, everyone's talked about his plus minus being one of the worst in, in, in the second round. Again, he's at eight minutes to halftime. They've just kind of gone phased away from him. He's at five points at halftime for minus three, one for two from three. And that's about it. Ball's not in his hands. Um, I wouldn't look too much into numbers. I think numbers in playoffs, Definitely should go down as far as averages go, unless you're the top tier max guy. You're going to go down a little bit numbers wise, but he he looks his confidence looks shot. The key for me for OKC, yes, Giddy's important to him, but Chet Holmgren. I mean, he needs to be better. He, he's not um, having an imprint on this series. It's his first playoff series. He's going to go through the ups and downs of it, but he's he's the key. He's the key. Can you can you make Dallas adjust and get those? kind of slower, not as mobile bigs out of that pain area to guard you by knocking down some threes, by causing some mismatch problems. As of now, Lively and Gafford are winning the battle against Holmgren, in my opinion. They're, they're, they're doing more. They're putting pressure on the rim. They're rolling. They're putting Holmgren in in kind of tough spots about overhelping with Kyrie or Luca. Then all of a sudden, Luca bounces it between your legs, You know, hits one of those guys for a dunk. 
um, and, and it becomes a you know a little bit frustrating from from that aspect of things. But I think Holmgren's a key for them. Pro, they need more. I think he's at thirteen and seven or something like that. They need to get into the 18, 19s, get him some easy looks, knock down a few threes. But Dallas, you know, I'm, I'm changing my pick. I think even obviously knowing that they're up in game three helps. But I, I think they've they've found it. They've found they've just found their roles. They can they're like a machine. They look. What I look for in playoffs and I look for with good teams is when they become machine-like where you can see the method to the madness and it just churns along. No matter what you do defensively, you throw a zone at us, you double us, you do this, it just churns along. Dallas is in that position where it's just in a perpetual flow and, and Steve used to always – Steve Kerr used to always harp on the flow, keep the flow going and it'll eventually turn in the game. And you can just see in certain parts of games they don't panic – a la Denver, like the last two games, the good teams, they just continue to turn on. And, and Dallas has kind of found that. Their rotations are tight. Um, they've got good role players in Green and Exum that are playing minutes now. Like I said, Lively, Gafford, Mix. And then you've got Hardaway and, 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 and Washington can go for 25 on any given night. I like where they're at. So I'm, I'm going to go with them um, winning this series 4-1, if not 4-2. Yeah, um, I think they're playing great. And, and I think they've figured out the the dynamic of what to do. You know, I think that, look, during the season, it was like Lucas takes 25 shots, Kyrie takes 24 shots, and then whoever else, they'll get Gafford on rolls, Hardaway might do something. The problem with their team, in my opinion, even though they were playing great after the trade when they got Washington and they got Gafford, was Hardaway and Washington were so inconsistent. Inconsistent shooting the ball, they shot themselves out, and Luca and Kyrie can't do it themselves. You know, Gafford and Lively are good on rolls and lobs and things, but when you take the lob away and those, you know, and you're smothering those guys defensively and trying to do your best, you know, with Kyrie and Luca, you can shut them down if not those guys down, but if you shut everyone else down, they you can grind out wins against those guys. Now they play great post trade. With PJ Washington, in my opinion, two things have been the key to the series. PJ Washington stepping up. Scoring 22 a game. That guy has been one of the more inconsistent players since he got into the league, you know, five years ago or so. He just, he's one of those guys that could score 25 and then eight straight games to score seven on like 12% shooting. Right now, he's shooting 53% from three. He shoots about 33 in his career. He's shooting 54 from the field, 44, you know, 44 for his career, he's shooting 54 for the series. It seems like every time that they draw two to the ball, either Luca or Kyrie, you know, they kick to Washington. He's making that corner three and he's making plays. Those guys are driving it to home grin. Even though home grin's got three blocks, they're being extremely physical and getting knocking him his ass on the floor. If I'm playing Oklahoma City, that's the guy I'm attacking. I talked about it with the New Orleans series. If I was them, I would not try to hurt him, of course. You'd never want to do that. But you want to rough the guy and knock him in his ass 20 times during the night. You want to make sure it's rough because his body can't take it right now. I'm sure his strength's going to improve throughout his career. Right now, it can't. It could be, you know, he's a unbelievably offensively gifted player that could also block shots, but you could really just drive it at his chest, you know, any given, any given possession. I think the second thing that they've been doing well, Bogues, is it's not dominating shots from Luca and Kyrie. I talked about it in the first series, it wasn't quite there. I think Luca averaged like 20 shots a game or so, and Kyrie averaged about 18. Right now, Luca's averaging 19 shots a game in the series. Kyrie's only averaging 13 shots. I think getting Kyrie off the ball more and getting other guys involved and spreading out the field goal attempts, especially when guys can make shots, even though Hardaway hasn't been great shooting it, you know, giving him looks, giving Josh Green in that left corner looks, you know, and just spreading it out on top of uh, giving Gafford and Lively the ball and lobs and short rolls. But being able to spread it out, be able to get Luca off the ball a little bit where he doesn't have to work as hard and his usage isn't as high. And then P.J. Washington being that steady shooter that could consistently knock down shots. How are you going to guard him? You send two to Luca. Luca's going to get off the ball to Kyrie. Kyrie, instead of trying to over dribble and, and, and create, he's just giving the ball up. And then he facilitates. And then when he needs to, late shot clock, he's one of the best finishers in the game. You know, so that's why they're so tough to guard. 
you know, because Luca and Kyrie could break you down, could score from the outside, could score in the mid range, could get to the basket and score, but also give the ball up. But the problem was over the last season, they haven't had anybody consistent that they could really throw the ball to. You know, when they get doubled and and they and they kick it out, and then you get full rotation and scrambles. Now with PJ Washington making fifty plus percent from the three, it's almost they're almost unguardable, and they're doing such a good job defensively locking in, like you mentioned. You know, that was a great point by you, by Luca, Luca and Kyrie not being, you know, actually being engaged defensively. It re- it's really a, a difference maker in this series. And I think um, I think they're going to be tough. I think they're going to go to the conference finals and it's going to be an unbelievable series between whoever wins that Denver series. And I think I think. In my opinion, I think Dallas wins the series. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay, so you just look a little that young kind of freedom they played with throughout the regular season in the first round, where the, the, the no care factor, we're young and dumb. They're starting to they're starting to think a little bit. Whereas when they were successful, it was that young brash. We're not thinking. We're just playing. It starts to grind down in the playoffs. You start to overthink things. So, all right, some news. We don't have to get into these, but MVP Jokic, three and four years. Uh, congratulations to him. Defensive Player of the Year, Rudy Gobert. Deserve it, in my opinion. He's copped a lot of flack, but their their defensive numbers as a team speak for themselves. So the flack that he gets, um, it's always head-scratching. Lottery has been announced pro. Number one pick, Atlanta Hawks, uh, Washington Wizards, Houston Rockets, three, San Antonio, Detroit, Charlotte, Portland. Toronto is eight. It goes to San Antonio. Memphis, nine. Utah, 10. Chicago, 11. Houston is 12. It goes to OKC. Uh, 13 sack, 14 Golden State, which goes to Portland. And it's rumored the Atlanta Hawks will be taking Saar with the number one pick pro, uh, Perth Wildcat. So I wonder if that that would be great for the NBL uh, and and solidifies the next star program. So I'm, I'm interested to see how that all goes. But um, yeah, not not the deepest draft, I don't think, pro uh, this season. There's, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of kind of debate around that, but um, Atlanta Pro, if you're a gambling man, they had three percent odds to win that first pick, so they've, they've done pretty well. Done pretty well to get to get that. That's insane. Like if you look at it, first of all, I don't think I've never seen it where people cared less about a lottery. <laughs> In my, I've covered the lottery thirty years, probably since I was now thirty six years since I was about twelve. You know, I, I was been watching that lottery. And it just seemed like nobody cared. But the funny part is Portland, they got a low pick. They were the worst. Te- they were 21 wins. Detroit, they're out of the top few picks. They win 14 games. Washington, 15 wins. They get second. San Antonio, 22 wins. Houston gets like the third pick. They were the 11th. Atlanta, they get, they're the 10th. They were the 10th team in the East, made the play in, I believe. And now they they're one. now they get yeah. the first pick. That is unbelievable. But yeah, hey, good luck to Atlanta. Memphis but, um, getting nine is a bit rough. You know, <laughs> how about Memphis that's and Charlotte? Unbelievable. Yeah, Memphis and Detroit, for that matter. But yeah, that, that's just how it goes with with the luck of it, bro. Right? Now, hopefully, it is the luck yeah. of it. But who knows? Yeah. All right, Brian Keith expected to keep the Wizards head coaching job, uh, rumored, um, which I think is we both know him. That's a, I think that'll be. Washington's best bet. Brandon Ingram is available yes. uh, on the trade block. Trey Young expected to be moved. DeMar DeRozan expected to re-sign with the Bulls. Um, that's kind of it news-wise. I just wanted to touch on the Pat Beverly uh, interview post uh, his loss to – all these teams lost to the Indiana Pacers. Uh, I thought it was a pretty poor form. Um, he, mm-hmm. he he claims that it was jovial. It didn't look jovial because he just lost and he's he deadpan serious. But an ESPN reporter had asked him a question. He asked, do you subscribe to my podcast? She said, no. He said, you cannot ask me a question then now. It cuts away pretty quickly, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think they took it very humorous, in a very humorous vein. Pretty poor, man. Like, it just, it's just like, dude, what, like, what are you doing? Um, just, it's unprofessional. Yeah, just unprofessional. So I don't think we have to get too much into it. But Pat Bev had a rough rough 48 hours, that, and throwing a ball to, into the crowd, getting fined, yeah. getting fined for that. I think there's a, the yes, the, the, the criminal complaint. So charge. Yeah, but come on, you got to whip a ball. I mean, yeah, you got to whip a ball at a fan. Come on, I mean, twice. I've never se- twice. Yeah, I've never seen a guy. I don't know, man. I, I I've never seen a player strike two on a same night that took unprofessionalism to a new level, and he knows better than that. 
And you got to take losing better than he took it. And look, if it was something really vile that that other guy said, he would have had him thrown out. Let's be honest, right? And I don't know what was said or what wasn't said or whatever, but you don't whip a ball. Someone could get hurt. That could be a kid. He hit a woman. I mean, it's just uh, that's that's your client base. You know, you, it's just a bad look. I, I that's all I got to say. It's just an unprofessional move. Super quick one on this one. Jamal Murray threw a fucking stool. Oh, yeah. a heat pack. I saw During that. During live Actually, that's play, right. That's right, bro. Got fined 100K. Beverly throws a ball at a fan, gets suspended four games. Like, a lot of rhetoric. Oh, really? Yeah, four game suspension yeah. starting next year, yeah, right? with the Oh, yeah, he did get suspended four games. Great job, Trent, on that. Right. And so oh, that is... Everyone's rhetoric the, right now is Adam Silver saving the TV ratings by not suspending Jamal in the middle of a very important playoff series. And that's fair. Uh, but I, I would hate to see him suspended for that in series. I think the Beverly thing. Have you ever seen anything like that's that crazy. in your life? Well, the ref was looking like, where the hell did this come from? It's a heat pack. But you, well, you, in, in the well, game, you can't blame the ref because you don't know where it came from, right? But I think they should have fined him harder. I would hate to see a suspension for it. But it does set a pretty bad precedent because you've obviously gone, oh, the Bucks aren't in the playoffs. Beverly's out. Four games next season. But I think... This is my thing. I think in the NBA, I think they should change the rule where all suspensions are regular season games with pay. So I hate, I don't like the whole getting suspended in conference finals and finals. I think it, it, it I, for what you've done, like the Draymond text, for instance, I know it's a soft spot because it's close. I was on that team, but I think it, what you've done in the re- regular season shouldn't count towards the playoffs. That's my opinion on it. I think you get a, a clean slate and I think you should cop the penalty for regular season games, kind of like footy. Back in the day, I don't think you should be suspended. But then the problem is it gives guys like Draymond a full green light to just go mental in the playoffs because there's no there's no, there's no big penalties. So it's kind of tough. But I want to see the best play, man. I'm a fan. Yeah, I get it. But teams have won championships based yeah, on 100%. suspensions. Yeah, yeah no and doubt. Like you, then you give Denver the pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's – like and he, he suspended said, that game. They lose. They probably lose because he, yeah. he had a real good game that game. Exactly. So I, 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 I thought that was amazing. And it's a like fair you point. said, it sets a crazy precedent for the it following is. years. Well, shit. Does I mean if Draymond? That's going to be Draymond's go to now. Then if they make the playoffs again, just throw a heat pack at the referee and you're like, I'll take the hundred k, mate. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, tough. The, the way the way Marty was shooting, he shot three for eighteen that night. So I'm not surprised that he missed the referee on that <laughs> on that throw in the fucking heat pack. But it's just a bad look. I mean, someone. Could blow a knee out, you know, not not from the heat pack itself, but like landing on it, yeah, or slipping on it. It's a ref. It's just like, a bad, yeah, it's a, it's a bad and, fucking. And, look. and those fucking things have a shitload of moisture, so if you drop those on the ground, he, they leave a massive wet spot. But uh, yeah, good good note pick up there, Trent. I didn't, I didn't realize that Beverly got four games for it. That that's I thought you just yeah. got a fine, but uh, I think the fan. Uh, I thought you were going to touch on that. I think they fired an assault. I think I read that somewhere. Might have been NBA. a lady got hit. And those yeah. balls, those NBA balls, you know, you know how it is, man. Yeah, like, hard. Those NBA yeah. balls hurt, dude. It ain't, it ain't a soft fucking Nike ball or something. Mm. That's that's a hard ball. That could fuck you up. Uh, last two things: Bill Simmons says, has reported the TNT lo- that TNT has lost the NBA media deal to NBC, which will be announced soon. So that's interesting. I mean, NBC had those those awesome intros back in the day. I used to love watching those as a young kid. So hopefully they bring those old school ones back. But uh, losing TNT, I wonder what that does to the uh, to the Shaq Ernie and and, and Chuck show. Um, Chuck Chuck has said that he has a clause in his contract that if TNT lose the NBA rights, he's done because he just signed a big deal to stay there yeah. for like a long okay. time. So so maybe he goes to NBC. Yeah. But Ernie said he's staying with TNT with, with Turner. So he does college stuff so, too, right, Ernie? Um, and so yeah, and so Ernie's been there. Well. Bogues, I was like fucking twelve. Or thirteen when TNT just started, um, you know, showcasing the league, and mm. Ernie was back then. I mean, he, he's he's been yeah. with them a long well, no time. No basketball though. The- what, what do you do? What does Ernie do? So I mean, yeah, just an interesting one. We'll see. They're supposed to be announced soon. They want to, they'll probably announce at the end of this round. Uh, the last one I want to touch on was the Pat Riley postseason rap press conferences, which are fucking great. <laughs> like mm. he's one of the only guys that goes this like really goes this hard. And has a lot of hurrah about it because the dude's super honest. Um, and there's there's no punches pulled. He's quoted as saying, if you were not on the court playing, you should keep your mouth shut. And that was regards to Jimmy trolling the Celtics. He called Tyler Hero fragile. Um, so he needs to be on the court more. And he you know, referenced his diet and probably his off court activities. I mean, these are great. And and not many people can get away with them, and not many GMs would be confident enough to go this route. But it's just nice to see, you know, uh, 
just some honesty. Like most GMs, yeah, we're looking forward to next season. He's still our guy. And all whilst they're getting texts about trade proposals for that guy they're saying is their guy, whereas Pat Riley's like, yeah, he's on a, he's on the fucking block. Like no punches pulled. So I enjoy that pro. I'm not, I'm not sure if you tune into him, but I always watch the highlights of him because he he calls a spade a spade, pro. Folks, if – um. I mean, Pat Riley's amazing, and I did catch both of them. And he just, that's what it is. Like, he's been like that. It's great. If you read, if you read, uh, Jeff Perlman, I had the book about the Lakers, you know, sort of from the 70s on, and it covers how, like, Pat Riley is a coach and all the players, but like, just sort of how Pat became Pat. And then I, I read a book, um, about the Knicks when, when Pat coached the Knicks and just sort of his background and how, you know, how rigid he is and, you know, just he's no nonsense. I remember when he was on the Heat, they, they got Antoine Walker and they wouldn't let Antoine participate in, in, in the team until he passed his body fat test and his running test. So like, and then I, I just, again, I, I've covered this a million times in the pod about how the, the big th- or the, 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 the came team to fire Spo, right? The, yeah, the large I wouldn't call him a big three, but I'll call him the large three. Um those guys wanted to fire Sp- you know, Spolstra. If any other GM in the league, except maybe Sam Presti, Tim Conley, and maybe one other guy, if they went into you know, Brad Stevens, definitely not. If they, definitely if you go in, in most twenty four other GM's offices and said that the three best players come in and said you gotta fire your coach, that coach is gone yesterday. And Pat Riley was, was basically fuck off. You're not doing it. You know this is my right. team. This is yeah. how, and this is how organizations. A, you need to know what you're doing, but B, you're gonna have balls, and you have to have guts to stand up to people and do what's right. Not fall victim or fall into what everybody wants you to do, but what you feel as though your vision is, and what and like he's been big on body fats. You know, since he was with the Lakers, like he studied that stuff and he's just like, and he's not going to let up and he's not going to, you know, he's going to fight you all day, every day. And the owner, he, and, and this is the problem with ownership in the NBA for the most part, ownership's a hundred percent behind him. So he can do what he exactly. wants. Exactly. I was going to bring this up, bro. The, what's changed yeah. today is players, players and agents now have a direct line to the owners, right? And a lot of the yeah. owners want that. They want to be seen courtside. They want to be seen like they're the you know, interim GM at times, you got to have your, your GM needs to be fully backed by your owner and vice versa. And there's not many teams that do that because the owner is going to look at like, I hired you to fix this. I thought, you know, they have that good relationship and that makes a huge difference, man. But there wasn't a time back in, you remember the owners back in the day, pro, like you wouldn't even know mm-hmm. who they, you would really not even know who they were half the time. Like our owner no. and the more box, Senator Cole would come once, once a month, maybe and just say hello, do the rounds at the facility. He wasn't there every day. Mm-hmm. Wasn't there every week. He come to all games, but you wouldn't see him. Whereas that's changed completely now with social media and owners wanting to be more relevant. It's created a direct line. So players now, max players at least, can go, I'm just going to skip the GM. I'm just going to go straight to the owner and say, get the coach out. And the GM does, the GM's just told like, hey, get the get the coach out. So yeah, it's good to see with the Miami. Let, let's finish this up, bro. We're at two hours. Uh, a couple of our mm-hmm. listeners are already la- uh, yawning. Um, stats, useful, useless. Josh Hart leading the playoffs with 120 rebounds. 13.3 rebounds per game is most by a Nick in a playoff run since Willis Reed in 1970. He's 6'4", pro. Useful or useless? Useful, and I'm not even going to give any any other dialogue <laughs> to that. I want to get the fuck out of here. Useful, so useful, useful. All right, last one. Uh, Derek White before today's game and he's bad shooting. First player in over 20 years, uh, so the first, first round series, t- to average 20-plus points on 55% field goal, 50% three-point, and 90% free throw percentage in a playoff run. First time in twenty over twenty years, pro useful, useless. I'm gonna one up you on that. I'm gonna say it's total useful. So yes, totally not useful. only useful but total useful. I agree. Yep. Uh, unbelievable role role player and uh, does everything the right way. All right, NBL news, pro. Uh, I'm not sure if you know who Corey Homicide Williams is. Yeah, I, do. Uh, I just want to send out condolences to his family from from the basketball family in Australia. Uh, he passed away with a tough battle, stage four. Um, cancer, you just never want to see, see it. And speaking to some people close to him, it, it all just happened quickly. Nine months ago, 10 months ago, felt bad. Um, went for a routine check and, and, uh, got, got put under for the check. Work, uh, sorry, was, was asleep at that night at the hospital. 
And the doctor came in and woke him up mid-morning and said, we've got bad news. Um, and he's like, how can this happen? I felt no symptoms. And sometimes people don't feel those symptoms till it's too late. So everyone out there listening, colonoscopies, all that, get your prostate checked. You know, you can even go and get uh, calcium scores uh, through a CT with, I think, a dye injection, which gives you a baseline. Get those every couple of years, and then at least you kind of know where you're, where you're sitting. And if things fluctuate and change, you've got a baseline. So um, may he rest in peace. I know uh, him and I had had a banterous back and forward relationship. Look, it was never for me from a point of like we hate each other. We'd see each other. We'd, we'd actually laugh when we saw each other about – tweets back and forth and some banter that we got into and, and, and laugh about it. Um, yes, I went at him hard sometimes. Yes, he went at me hard t- sometimes, but that was part of part of the show. Um, he was obviously part of the NBL at a time where the where the uh, the league was 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 in an okay spot and he was definitely part of the journey to get it to where it was. A, definitely a showman, a great player, former league MVP. So we, we wish we wish his family, I think a young child too as well, which makes it the hardest part. Um that you know that young child won't 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 know their father but that's that's a part of life and i know the nbl community basketball community has really really got around Corey homicide williams an honorary aussie as well so we uh i hope his family's doing well and and may he rest in peace will be remembered forever in the nbl uh nbl has striked a deal a new media deal so back on free to air again and you know you got to be careful with Trent with the free to air because that can mean nine go and this and that. This deal now is on is on the, the main network ten for their Sunday afternoon matinee games, uh, which are around about two thirty p.m. on Sunday afternoons live on the main channel on Channel Ten Pro. So that that is huge huge news for the NBL to get back to to there. I know they uh, we pushed them to put the Christmas Day game on that channel. They did. They got really good numbers on the Christmas Day game the last couple of years, especially the first year. So I think they've seen the writing on the wall. They should do this. And obviously it'll still be on KR Sports, Fetch TV, and ESPN's um, NBL programming will be as per normal every game on, on ESPN. So good to see the NBL up and there. Not a whole lot of other news really around the NBL. Um, Derek Walton Jr. is signed with the Phoenix Kings. By the way, the Southeast Melbourne – Kings light now, I'm going to call them because they're just basically <laughs> like four or five of our players over the last couple of years, but good on them. They're sure up. Tyler Harvey has re-signed with the Illawarra Hawks and the Melbourne Boomers WNBL license. Um, bit of issue there has been transferred to Geelong and they will become Geelong United, much to the demise of of people involved in the Melbourne Boomers, not too happy with basketball Australia, but that has been um, done, facilitated, all, all good to go. Geelong United will be a new club in the WNBL Pro. Pro, fact or fake news? Should we do a fact or fake news? Uh, f- we will be doing a fact and fake news. Will be fake news because we're not fucking doing it. Beautiful. We fit the fuck I had out a feeling. of it. I just led you in. I had a feeling. But uh, long one today, two hours, all the playoff stuff takes some time. Um, next week will be a bit better just because we'll have, you know, there's not, there won't be eight series to, to uh, go over and then, and then you know, four in the, in the conference finals or the semifinals. So there'll only be couple left after that, but uh, let's see how our picks go. I haven't been doing too well in mine. Pro, you've been probably better this season, which is uh, which hurts the heart <laughs> for me, Pro. But we'll uh, we'll see you next next couple of weeks and uh, enjoy the games. See you, Pro. All right, enjoy, guys. Thank you.